Hey, thanks for checking out the first video of the new year. Hopefully you all had a good holiday and a good new year and you're ready to get back into learning about Maya and Blender and game animation and really all things animation. That's kind of the focus here on this channel. So obviously I've been in a bit of a hiatus. I haven't uploaded anything in a few months now. And one of the reasons for that is going through the process of moving. Obviously you can see my background is different now. So moving took some time out of my schedule and just really, I just kind of needed a break from things and kind of just recharge um, and take advantage of the holiday and not really focus on a ton of extra work outside of my regular day job at Blizzard. So now we're back into the new year and I'm ready to get back into creating some content for you all. And this first video of the new year is a pretty big one. It's a masterclass. So this is a pretty chunky video. I, I think it's probably over three hours. I'm not sure the actual final uh, total for it, but my original idea for this video was to be a part of kind of this sort of premium or paid content. Um, so the original idea was this was just going to be a small chunk of a much larger type of kind of workshop. And I've kind of rethought how I'm going to approach any of that type of stuff. And I've just been kind of sitting on this this masterclass for about a month now, not really sure what to do with it. And then I just decided I might as well just release it for free. I don't really plan on doing any type of premium content with this course here. So I thought I might as well release it for you all so you guys can get hopefully some benefit out of it and learn some things about how I approach creating walk cycles. And again, this was supposed to be one chunk of a course. So I think in this, I probably mention, you know, the next steps later on in the course, because one of the plans was to dive into multiple different types of walk cycles, a lot of different, you know, personality type of walk cycles. Um, but yeah, I decided to just release this for free. So hopefully you all can get some, some helpful, helpful information out of it. So I just wanted to give this quick introduction, give you guys an update on kind of where I've been over the past couple months. And then the plan for this new year is to really get into creating more content on YouTube. Um, not sure if I'm going to be doing really yet much more of these big chunk, really long courses. Um, if this is something you guys are really into, then I can definitely look into doing more master classes like this. Um, they just do take obviously a really long time to create. So it means probably less content, less frequent content on my YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, just let me know in the comments below and thanks for watching and hopefully you find this masterclass helpful. All right, so before we actually jump into our 3D software and start animating our walk cycles, we first need to really understand the fundamentals of a walk and how a person actually walks. We need to really kind of understand the body mechanics, the weight, so that we can better bring it to life in the 3D software. So we're gonna go over a few video reference examples to take a look at a person actually walking so we can see how the body moves, how the feet move, so that we can really pick apart those main poses that make up a walk cycle. So we're first gonna take a look at some reference here, and this is some really awesome reference. We have this grid as well as the side and front view. So we can really get a strong sense and understanding of kind of the mechanics of a walk. And we can also pick apart those main kind of poses that make up a walk here. So one of the most important things to look at when you're viewing walk cycle reference is to pick apart those main key poses. And there's really four poses that make up a walk cycle. So if we just scrub through here, we have this pose right here, and this would be considered the contact pose. We have the heel pointed, lifted up off the ground. This heel is rolling off the ground as well. We have pretty much a full extension on this leg here, and then pretty much a full extension on this leg. There's still a little bit of bend in the knee, but this is what you would call the contact position. And this contact position is really the first pose that you wanna start with when you're building your walk cycle. And if we scrub forward through here, this right here would be considered what would be the down position. So this would be the down position of the walk. You can see the weight of the person has now kind of planted on this left supporting leg. So you can see we get a nice bend in this leg. We also have the hips dropping down. So if I just jump between the previous pose, so you can see the, the hips are actually dropping down. If we look at the grid, we have this nice grid line. So you can see the hips are actually dropping below that eight grid line there. So 
This is the down position where our character is kind of letting their weight drop and letting this leg now support the weight of their body. And we still have this back leg on the ground, but it's really kind of peeling off here. We basically just have the toes on the ground at this point. And this is really the lowest point of your walk cycle is the down position. And then if I scrub forward here, the next kind of key pose of your walk should be probably right around here. And this would be the passing position. So this is the passing position, kind of the midway point of the walk cycle, kind of right, right in the middle of your walk. You can see this leg in the back, kind of drawing it here, is still pretty bent, but it, we have our character's weight now directly above this supporting leg. And then we have this leg in the front view here, kind of right in that midpoint position here. So we have that leg right kind of at the center of the character. We've got it lifted completely off the ground now. And then as we scrub forward, we have this position right here and right around frame 87 or so, right around here, this would be the up position. So you can see that now we're getting an extension on this leg in the back. The heel is starting to lift off the ground. So you can see if I jump from the passing position to the up position, you can see that the heel is completely flat on the ground on this pose, and then it starts to kind of peel off the ground here. This leg is now swinging forward, getting ready to actually go into that contact position for the opposite leg. And the up position is typically the highest point of the walk, the highest point that the hips get. If I jump to frame 33, where we have our contact position, you can see if I take a look at this grid line right here, kind of the point where these hips are located. And then if I jump to the up position, you can see the rising up above that. So this is typically where you would see the highest point of your walk cycle. And then as we scrub forward through here, we get basically the next contact position. We have this nice straight leg, this leg in the back still has a little bit of bend to it, and that heel is peeling off the ground. So we get that nice extension there for the contact and the opposite foot. So really we have the contact position, we have the next pose down, the passing, the up, and then the next contact position. So really there's one, two, three, and four poses here that make up this walk cycle. We have the contact, the down, the passing, the up, and then just the contact, the reverse contact for the opposite foot. So those are the main key poses that you need to find and really begin to flesh out in your animation. These are the most important poses to get right to make sure that your walk actually feels like a walk cycle. And if we take a look at our front view here, there's some really important things to point out. So you can see at our contact position, you can see kind of the position of our hip right here. And the hip is positioned slightly over this direction. And then as we scrub forward to the down position, you can see our hips are now shifting over here, this direction. And it's because the weight is coming down on this supporting leg here. So again, this is the down position, so that weight is coming down. This leg is starting to support that weight, which means the hips are going to shift over that supporting leg. And then this foot right here is starting to peel off the ground. And then as I scrub forward through here into the passing position, you can see the hips are shifted over even more over this supporting leg here. We have this nice straight on the leg. Again, this foot is starting to lift off the ground right in that midway point of the walk and we can see the hips lifting off the ground there. And one really important aspect to look at when you're looking at a walk cycle, especially from the front view when looking at your reference, is to make sure you're getting the hip rotation correct during a walk cycle. So if I scrub forward through here, one thing I want to point out is that if we take a look at the hips here, and I'll just draw a line. Sorry, my lines aren't perfectly straight there, but so we've got this hip position here. We'll kind of just draw a straight flat line. And as I scrub forward through here, going into the down position, we're shifting our hips 
So they're starting to rotate more this direction on that leg that is actually supporting our weight. And then this leg in the back is starting to lift off. So that's a really important aspect to get right when you're building your walk cycle is making sure you have the hip rotation correct and moving in a believable way. So when a person is shifting their weight onto their supporting leg, their hips are actually going to shift up in that position. And that's really going to help sell the weight on this walk cycle. Something that can be easy to get wrong if you aren't looking at reference when building a walk cycle is that you might think that if your leg is lifting off the ground, your hips actually need to move and rotate in that direction. So say for example, he's lifting his left leg off the ground. You would think that because this left leg is lifting, you need to move your hips this direction to give that room to or excuse me, to give that leg room to move upward. But it's actually the opposite of that since this leg right here is what is supporting our character's weight, completely supporting all of our character here on his right leg. The hips need to shift in that direction. So they need to actually shift this way up for that supporting leg. And then as we scrub forward here, the hips are gonna start to flatten out, going back into that contact position. And then for this side, we'll get something similar. You can see as soon as that weight drops down on that supporting leg, the hips shift. And now we get rotation like that in the hips. Now, obviously I'm doing a bit of exaggeration with these lines to kind of show that rotation but that is what the hips are doing there. And that's important to really understand when you're building a walk cycle to make sure you've got the feeling of weight properly in your animation. And typically what you'll find with a walk cycle is that the chest is actually going to kind of counter that rotation. So you can see the hips are rotated this direction and the chest is going to be rotated opposite that direction. Now that's not always the case. That's kind of a good rule of thumb to use, but you can kind of vary that that rotation in your animation or even in some real world reference, you'll find that's not always the case. The way this guy is walking, it is it does feel a little bit exaggerated, like he's got a little bit of kind of like swagger to his walk. So he's really kind of exaggerating those rotations on the hips and the chest, which is really good in our case to kind of spot, spot those key moments. And then as we scrub forward through here, you can see kind of similar similar movement on the chest there. And something else to point out when looking at walk cycle reference is the feet do not really lift off the ground that high. So typically when we're walking, we try to use the least amount of effort possible. So we really aren't going to lift our feet really high off the ground. That would also give the walk cycle a very kind of stompy feeling to it, which isn't really what we would want. So if you're looking at reference, you'll often find that as he slides his foot across the ground, you can see that it looks like his toes are actually kind of sliding on across the ground. So there's even a little bit of contact maybe on the very tip of his foot there as he swings his foot forward. So we're, we typically, you know, swing our foot really close to the ground. We're not going to lift our foot, you know, really high up in the air as we're walking, unless you're making some type of like marching style walk. So typically as we push off, you can see the foot is lifted probably at the highest point right here as it's moving into the passing position. And then as it swings through the passing position into the up position, the foot is just getting closer and closer to the ground until it gets into that contact position. So again, these are really the main poses that are going to make up a walk cycle, the contact, down, passing, up position, and then the next contact position. So in the next video, let's take a look at some more reference, but this time it's a little bit more exaggerated and the walk cycles have a bit more personality to them. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at some more real world walk cycle reference so that we can better understand kind of the fundamentals of a walk cycle. So in this video, this is from content creator and animator Kevin Perry. He has this really awesome video where he goes through a hundred different styles of walk cycles. So this is where we can really start to see that personality come into play within a walk cycle. And also we can see really the same exact kind of main poses that make up almost all of these walk cycles. So you're still going to have that contact, the down, the passing, and the up position, but you'll see all the personality that he's able to get within these walks. So let's go ahead and play it here. And it's gonna start with, you know, the generic walk cycle here. 
we have the feminine walk. And then as he goes through here, you can see all the different types of personality he's able to get within all of these walk cycles. And a lot of these, you can immediately see kind of the the thing he's going for here, the kind of chimpanzee walk, the sassy walk. He's adding all this personality into these walks to really sell kind of the feeling that he's going for. And if we start with kind of going through this generic walk real quickly, you'll see kind of all the main things that we pointed out before, the contact position, the passing, the down position, the passing position, and then the up position, and then the next contact position. So we have our generic basic walk cycle. And then as we get into the feminine walk, you'll still see a lot of those main key points in the walk. Things might be positioned slightly differently, but you can see we have our contact position, the down position, and then that up position moving through here. Obviously the, the legs here, if we look at them, it's keeping and maintaining a straight position for pretty much most of the time a foot is on the ground. So if we take a look at the contact position here, we have a really completely straight leg. The leg you can see kind of locks into this straight position. And then as we go through here, even in the down position, we get the feeling of the down position with the weight coming down, but you can see the hips don't drop quite that far. And you can see the rotation that we're getting on the hips is really exaggerated to maintain that straight leg all the way through the down position all the way through the passing position, all the way through the up position, and then we get a tiny slight bend in the leg on that contact, and then obviously the bend as the leg steps through here. But you can see that he's maintaining this completely straight leg all through the main poses of the walk. So even though we still have the main four poses, the contact position, the down position, the passing, and the up position, he's built more personality and a feeling into this walk by kind of changing up those poses a bit and getting something like a completely straight leg through that entire point that the foot is on the ground. And that is also what's helping sell this to feel like a more feminine walk. And then obviously his arm movements and some of his chest movements help sell that. But even as we go through here, with a lot of these walks, we're still gonna have those main poses. And that's the important thing to understand when you're building a walk cycle, is that if you are going for something with a bit more personality like this, like a really exaggerated sneak walk cycle, you still need to have the fundamental understanding of what makes a walk in order to build something like this. So even in, in a very exaggerated walk like this, we have what is our contact position here. The toe is right on the ground. We're kind of getting a reverse contact on this position for this sneak. This is the point where that foot is on the ground, but with a you know a generic walk, you would have your heel on the ground versus your toe. But this, because it's a sneak, we're getting the toe contacting first, and then we still move into that down position. We still have our down position, we still have our passing position, and then we still have our up position, which is a really exaggerated up pose with that leg lifting really high off the ground. But again, even though this walk has a very distinct personality to it, we're still finding all of those main poses within this walk cycle. Getting a very angry walk, it's a much faster kind of kinetic feeling to the walk. We're still again getting that contact, the down position, the up position, and the next contact. You'll notice that if I play this at full speed, that down position is very snappy. It kind of goes quickly into that down position and then snaps right up into the passing position. So we get a quick movement into the down and then a snap up into the passing and the up position, which also helps sell this feeling of anger in the walk. And I'll kind of scrub forward through here to see some of the other styles of walk. And I highly recommend finding this video on YouTube because that way you can see all of the hundred different styles of walks he's going for in this video. And it's also some really great inspiration if you want to try to animate any one of these types of walks in your own animation. So let's actually jump down to some, some helpful sketches that we can take a look at for walk cycles. So if we take a look at the animator survival kit, we can kind of see a basic breakdown of the main poses of a walk cycle. Kind of the same thing I talked about when we broke down the first video reference. We have, you know, the contact, the down, the passing, 
and the up position and then the next contact. You can see in these drawings, we're getting kind of an exaggerated example of the walk. You can see we've got like a really far dip in the down position and then a really big extension on this up position with this really kind of straight leg in the back. But this is a really great way to, to see and visualize kind of the main poses that make up a walk cycle. And I can just jump through a few of these to take a look at them. Um, one important thing that I do want to point out is that you'll kind of see the trajectory that you would want or the path that you would want for the up and down movement of the hips. So we can see this line kind of drawn through here. So as I draw over this, we'll get kind of a shape roughly like that. We'll have the hips dipping down into the down position and then rising up and continuing to rise up all the way into the up position and then back into the down or excuse me back into the next contact position so this gives a good example a good representation of the path you know of the hips and then also obviously the head path based off that hip movement and then i'll quickly run through a few other examples from the animator survival kit if you don't have the animator survival kit i highly recommend picking up the book it has tons of really helpful reference and examples for building all different types of animations so in this reference we can see the kind of thing i was mentioning before looking at our first video reference where we have the hips kind of rotating shifting their rotation based off you know that supporting leg so now the hips are shifted up in this direction as the weight is getting placed on the right foot and then we kind of have the hips kind of bending down a bit toward that foot that's starting to contact and then we get that quick shift in the hips there to show and sell the weight transition there we can have the straight on the hips here and then here and then we can also see the counter on the chest through a lot of these kind of count, basically countering the rotation on the hip movement and again this is really important to really help sell the weight and the feeling for your walk cycle and then this is just another quick kind of breakdown this is actually showing a bit more of the timing for a a sort of default style of walk cycle which is going to be the first walk cycle that we create in this course is the sort of basic generic walk cycle so this is based off timing on 24 frames per second. So this would be animating at 24 frames per second. However, in this course, I'm going to be animating at 30 frames per second. That's just typically what I animate at. I usually work in video games and that's typically what you animate at in the video game industry. So as I'm working, my timing will be slightly different than a chart like you see here because I will be animating at 30 frames per second. But this does give you a strong kind of understanding of the basic timing for a walk cycle and these last couple examples here i've created this rough chart showing again the main poses that make up a walk cycle as well as the rough timing for a single step so again it's really important to kind of drill in these main poses of a walk cycle so that you can really understand them when you're building your walk cycle because knowing these poses and knowing how they're built is going to really help you go in there and then further add more personality to your walk, create things like that sneak or angry walk that we saw in the 100 walk cycle example reference. We first need to have a basic understanding of the main poses that make up a walk cycle before we can really go in there and start to exaggerate and play around with more distinct personality. So here you can see we have our contact, we have our down, we have the passing, the up position and the contact. And you can see the path if we look at the head, the path, through here again the same path would be on the hips but again you can see that that example of you know the lowest point of the walk is at the down position then we get to the highest point at the up position and then the timing for this specific walk that was animated here you can see down at the bottom and since this was animated at 30 frames per second you can see the timing is going to be slightly different than what we saw in the animator survival kit so starting at frame zero and frame zero is typically the frame I start at it. It just simplifies things a little bit in my head. Just thinking about if I'm animating at 30 frames per second, I know that if I go from frame zero to frame 30, that's going to be exactly one second. If I were to start at frame one, then it would just be, you know, 
30 sec or excuse me 30 frames or you know one second of animation would actually be at frame 31 since we're starting at frame one so starting at frame zero kind of just simplifies that for me in my head so that's just typically the frame i like to start animating at so frame four would be where we would hit our down position frame eight would be where we would hit our passing position frame 12 would be where we hit our up position and then frame 16 is where we would hit our next contact position for the opposite leg. So this would be one single step in the walk cycle. Now to complete a walk cycle, you would obviously need the step for the opposite leg. So that would mean this walk cycle to complete an entire cycle of the walk would take 32 frames. And if I take a look at this animation example here, this is basically the result of those poses that we just looked at. So this is the kind of style, sort of a very kind of generic feeling walk, but it's just really important to make sure that we're nailing down the fundamentals and understanding how to build a nice looking walk cycle before we start to add, you know, personality to the walk. It's really important that we first start with that generic style of walk cycle so that we can really understand the fundamentals. So the first walk cycle that we're going to create in this course is going to be this style of walk cycle right here, the generic walk cycle. So now that we've broken down the fundamentals of a walk cycle, we've looked at some really great real world reference. Let's now actually jump into our 3D software and finally start animating this generic style of walk. All right, so in this video, we're gonna take a brief look at the first rig we'll be using in this course for our generic walk cycle. And you can see this is a very simple, basic rig where we can really focus on our body mechanics. You can see we don't really have a face and we almost have this sort of like mannequin type model. And these rigs are really great to go in there and focus really on your body mechanics. It allows you to keep things simple. It's a very simple style. And on top of that, with it being such a simplistic rig, you can really always be sure that it's going to run really quickly inside of Maya. So this rig is actually created by Anna Matt on Gumroad. I will make sure to link this rig in the course description so you guys can download it yourself. It's a completely free rig. And again, it's a really awesome, simple model that allows you to really go in there and focus on the body mechanics. So once you have it downloaded and opened up, you should be presented with a view like this. So we're just gonna run through some of the controls on this rig so that we can quickly get familiar with the rig. Typically when you are working with a brand new rig, it's always good to just go in there and just experiment, play around with the rig, figure out where the controls are, what controls do what, as well as a lot of your space switching and a lot of your switches like IK and FK. So let's first go up here and we'll just start on the left arm here. So you can see we have our basic FK setup for our arm as well as our wrist. We also have the finger controls here. We can select them over here in our channel box to scrub them. You can also go in here on the individual finger controls and rotate them individually. We also have things like cup, which allows you to get a nice kind of relaxed pose. We also have spread so that we can bring in the fingers a bit closer. And then up here on this little green control, this is where we can actually switch this arm from FK to IK. So if we just type in a value of one here over on the channel box, it's now going to change this control to an IK control. So if you wanna use IK, you can go in here and use that little green controller to change that to an IK control. Now, something else that's really important to point out is if we select this upper arm control, come over here to the channel box and take a look at this local world attribute. So this will allow us to change the world and local space on this upper arm control. And that's really important for rotation. So if I were to select my main mover or my main root control here for the torso, with it set to a value of one, obviously because the arms are in FK, they're going to still kind of follow the body around, but you can see they're locked in that orientation. So the arms are still trying to kind of stay rotated forward in their current orientation. So you can see we're moving the body, but the arms are kind of trying to stay in their same rotation. Now, if I change this to a value of zero here, now if I move the torso, you can see this arm is going to just move one-to-one -one with the body. So it's going to be kind of locked to that body's rotation. 
So this will give you a different type of rotation on your arms. We can set this to a value of zero as well. That way, anytime we move the torso, or excuse me, the root control around, those arms are going to follow one to one. Anytime you move this chest around, those arms are going to follow one to one as well. So these are important attributes to make sure you know kind of where they're at. So if you ever need to adjust them, you'll be able to directly on the upper arm control here. And if we come up here to this top green control, this is how we can change the spine from IK, which I believe by default it comes in as an IK spine. And you can see the type of rotation that we get. So we have this one controller up here for the chest that, again, because it's IK, it's kind of controlling the entire spine there. And then also we can translate this around and change our pose. And typically, especially on this rig, I'll be using most likely this IK property here. But if you want to change this to an FK spine, all you need to do is select the green box. And I believe I made a mistake. I said it was up here at the top. It's actually down here at the side of the character. This is the actual spine FK IK controller. So if we type in a value of zero, you can see that's going to change the spine to the FK controls here. And then this one up here at the top, that's actually going to change the head from FK to an IK head. And we can change this back to IK. And then if we come down here, we also have the hip control. And then we also have the FK IK switch for the legs. Typically you would wanna keep your feet in IK for the majority of the time, but if you do wanna switch them to FK, you can type in a value of zero there. And typically you would use FK legs if you were animating something like maybe a character flying around where the feet actually don't need to be planted on the ground. Maybe a character kind of sitting on the edge of a wall and their legs are kind of dangling down. You might use FK controls for the legs in situations like that. But the vast majority of the time, you'd wanna use IK foot controls there. And then we also have the knee control. So you can see we have the sort of knee vector controls here so we can orient our knees around. By default, they should be following the movement of the foot. So you can see they're locked to the rotation of the foot as well. If we come in here to the control and change the follow to zero, that should mean that that knee control is gonna stay stationary. So it's not going to follow the legs or the foot's rotation. So you just need to go in here and move the foot around, then move the knee around to orient it to the proper direction. So typically I'll use the follow attribute on this knee so that anytime I move the foot around, that knee will already kind of start to rotate with it. Just speeds up the process a little bit. On the feet, we have, of course, our IK foot control here. We have some attributes in the channels for rolling the foot can rock the foot, use the stretchy and anti-pop attributes. If we ever run into kind of knee popping in our walk cycle, we can use these as well. We can adjust the length of our feet. And then you also have these outside controls for a few of the same properties. So this will allow you to control the toes and rotate from that position. This will be the roll in the mid toe position right there to get a nice foot roll. And then also we have the heel, heel control there. But you'll also see very similar controls again in the attributes as well. And if we come in here and select this main control, this big circle control around the entire character, this we can actually position our entire character around the scene. We can scale the character. And then you also have the option to hide or show certain curves and controls on the character. So you can see we can turn off the FK visibility, the IK visibility. We can toggle a lot of these different attributes here. We can turn on bend visibility. So you have a lot more individual kind of tweaker controls on this rig. Go ahead and toggle that off. We have arrow visibility. And so you can play around with the visibility if you don't need to see all the controls or if you wanna see things like that bend visibility. You could also toggle off the finger controls if you don't really need to see them at that moment. So that's just a really quick overview of this rig. Again, it's a really simple rig, so it's nice and easy to work with. So in the next video, let's actually begin setting up our scene for animation. 
All right, so before we actually go through the process of how I set up my scene in Maya for animation, I first really quickly wanna mention the tool I'm going to be using throughout this course. And this is the Animbot tool. You can see it down here above my timeline. This is a suite of a ton of different, really helpful animation tools that just speeds up the overall animation process. And the main tool we're gonna be using throughout this course is the mirror pose or the mirror animation tool. This is especially helpful when we are creating any type of cycle. It allows us to basically focus on sort of one side of the character once and then use this mirror tool to create the opposite side. So thinking of this in terms of a walk cycle like this, we would basically just need to animate one side of the step and then use this mirror tool to get the other step. So obviously you can see how much time that saves if we're basically only having to animate one step of the character. Now, unfortunately, Maya does not have a built-in mirror pose tool or a built-in mirror animation tool. And honestly, I think that's kind of crazy at this point that Maya still doesn't have that built-in functionality. It's basically at this point where the only way you can get this tool is if you use some type of third-party solution, whether that's a, you know, a free script you can find on Google that just does maybe the mirror pose function, or in this case, Animbot, which is an entire suite of tools that includes a mirror animation tool. So if you are interested in Animbot, check out the Animbot website. This is where you can actually download the plugin. It goes through the entire process on their website. You can go ahead and download the 30 day free trial. I don't believe you need to put in any payment information to get that access to the 30 day free trial. You can just download it, test it out. And then if you really enjoy it, you can come down here to the pricing. I use the eco version, which is the cheapest version. It gives me everything I need. You can see it's $60 per year or $5 per month. And again, once you use the Animbot tool, you'll really start to see how much it really speeds up your workflow. And you're really going to see it when we create this walk cycle. So I just wanted to point it out there that this is the tool I'll be using throughout this course. All right. So now that we've talked about the Animbot tool, let's go ahead and go through the process of actually setting up our scene for animation. So with this scene, I've already got the body mechanics rig inside of it. You'll notice though that my background is a little bit different than what you would see in Maya's default background. And basically what I have here is a sphere that is set to template. So it gives us this grid. If we come in here and select any one of these objects, I can select my floor. Let me actually go to the outliner. This will probably be a little bit easier to see in the outliner. So we have our lights and our grid. So you can see we have basically a sphere for the sky. And if you were to right click your sphere geometry, you can just come down here to actions and choose template, which will give you this sort of see through grid template. Now I am going to include this all in the project file. So all you really need to do is just import this scene environment into your scene and you should get exactly what I have here. So I have the templated floor, which gives us this sort of grid. You can see it's separate from the actual Maya grid. And then we have the sky background and then we have these sets of lights within our scene. And to turn on your lights, just press seven on your keyboard. You can press six to go back to the default lighting setup inside of Maya. But I like to have just some lights in there just to give my scene a little bit more interest. And then we can also come up here to the shadow if we wanna turn shadows on to again, just give our Maya scene just a little bit more fidelity as we're animating. So the next thing that I wanna do is come over here to the animation properties. We just have a few settings that we need to adjust. So under frame rate, I'm going to change this to 30 frames per second. That's typically what I animate at. I work a lot in the video game industry and that's usually what you animate at is 30 frames per second. So I've really gotten comfortable with that frame rate. So I'll go ahead and use it here. And then obviously you wanna make sure you have your playback speed set correctly. You don't wanna have it set on play every frame. That is something you'd use for if you're working with some type of simulation in here. I have my update view set to all. And then under animation, I usually use non-weighted tangents and I have my default in tangent as auto and my default out tangent as auto as well. So I'll go ahead and hit save. And then over here on the left, you can see currently my timeline is set to zero. I usually like to work at frame zero as my first frame of my animation. It just allows me to kind of break up my frame rate basically in a little bit easier to understand way because if I'm animating at 30 frames per second, I know that if I start at frame zero, at 
frame 30, that would be one second of animation. If I were to start at frame one, then that would mean 31 frames would be one second of animation. So for me, it just makes things a little bit more simple if I start at frame zero. So the next thing I like to do in my scene is go up here to show, and I like to hide everything. So I'll hit none. And then I like to just come up here to show polygons, show nerves curves. That way it just simplifies my scene a bit. You can see it removed those, the visibility of the lights there. All right, so now let's go ahead and bring in our reference that we'll be using to animate this walk cycle. So what I wanna do is go over here to panels. I wanna to go to orthographic and I wanna hit new and then I wanna to go to the left view. So I wanna have a new left view here. And then what I wanna do is come up here to view image plane and I'll choose import movie. So all of this reference will be included within your project file. So just navigate to wherever you saved off your files. And then for this, I'll go ahead and choose side view. I'll hit open. And now I want to go to show because I hid everything. I just need to go in and show image planes. So now we can actually see our reference image and we can come over here to the attribute editor. And we just want to make sure that when we brought this into the scene, we have the offset set to one. If I set this to zero, this video reference would start at frame one. However, I wanna start my animation at frame zero, so I would just need to add an offset of one frame. So now you can see we have the contact at frame zero and then the first part of the animation at frame one. So that's exactly what we want there. All right, now I can go ahead and just start scaling this up a bit. Doesn't need to be completely perfect. Just something like that. Go ahead and do that for now. And then I'm gonna come into perspective view and we should see this plane way off into 3D space. So I'm just gonna drag it so that if I move it in this direction, now if I go to the left view, it's actually behind our character, which is exactly what we want. So I can go ahead and scale this and just get a better idea of where this should be placed. So I'm gonna kind of shift the plane so the feet are right on the same plane as the feet of my character. So something like that should work just fine. Now I'm gonna to go to orthographic front view and do the exact same thing. So I'm gonna to go to view, image plane, movie. And again, just navigate to where you saved off your reference files. And I'll go ahead and choose import the front view. And that will bring it in and we can start scaling it up just like we did with the other view. And this doesn't really need to be that perfect. I'm bringing this in so that we have a really good guide to go off of, but I'm not gonna be you know, super strict on trying to make this exactly one-to-one -to, -one to the animation that I built to prepare for this course. And I can go to perspective and see where this is. So you can see the plane is right in the center of our character. We actually wanna move that out so it's not really in the view of our animation at all. And then I can jump back to the front view and something like that should work just fine. All right, cool, so we've got our reference images set up. Now the last thing I wanna do is import an Alembic cache. So with this walk cycle, I've taken the geometry and I've exported that out as a cache so that we can actually bring it directly into our scene. So we'll actually have this 3D model animating directly into our scene. So again, this will just give you even more reference to go off as you're animating this. So again, this cache will be included in the project files so you can import it yourself. So what I wanna do is come up here to cache. I'm gonna choose the GPU cache and I'll choose import. So again, you'll just find this wherever you saved off your project files. So we have the generic walk cache and I'll choose import. And you'll see this is actually going to import the geometry directly into our scene. Now we won't actually be able to see it in our scene until we go up to show and choose GPU cache. Now again, this will just give you even more reference to go off. So if we wanted to, we could just keep it directly in our rig here and kind of build our poses off this cache. This will just give us an even more stronger foundation to base this walk cycle off of. And I can start playing this animation and you can see it kind of moving through here. Now, the last thing I wanna do is make sure I change my timeline for the end frame. So currently it's ending at frame 150. So I'm gonna select this and type in 32. So that should be the last frame of our animation. So this is going to be a 32 frame cycle. And for now with this cache, I really don't need to see it right now. I'm probably not gonna use this too often unless I really wanna get kind of the exact same pose that we have from this cache onto our actual, actual geometry. So what I'm gonna do is under display, I'll just hit new layer. 
and I'll just double click this and change the name to cache, save it, and then I can just hide that. And then I can turn it on whenever I want to try to like get the exact same pose that we have here in our cache. All right, so we've got the scene completely set up, ready to start animating. So in the next video, we're actually gonna begin the process finally of building this generic walk cycle. In this video, we're gonna go through the process of creating our contact pose. And really, I spend the most amount of time creating this one pose. This is this pose I spend the most amount of time on when creating a walk cycle, because you'll see as we begin to animate further, a lot of the other poses are going to be kind of built upon this one contact pose. So let's actually go ahead and begin that process. And since I'm going to be using AnimBot, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and choose this create set, and this will allow me to create an animation selection set. And what I wanna do is just do a selection around all of the control curves on this rig. And then I'm gonna choose this selection set and I'll just type in all and hit the check mark and that will just add a selection set for all of our controls. And now with that set, I'm gonna to go to frame zero. I'm gonna press S on the keyboard to set a keyframe and then we can begin actually sculpting this pose out. So I'm gonna start placing it roughly into position and starting to tweak the controls here. And we can actually decide which control we would want to use for the ball roll. We could use the actual toe roll control. I'm gonna go ahead and actually zero that out and I might actually go ahead and just select the foot control here and go into the roll and just use that. We'll go ahead and use that for creating this walk cycle. And if we wanna do any further kind of fine tune adjust adjustments, we can just use this control. But I'll go ahead and use the slider here on the foot roll. All right, and I'll go ahead and start positioning this into place. And then on this foot, I wanna take that roll control and bring it up, something like that. All right, I think that works fine for us. And then what I'm gonna do is select the root control here for the torso, and I'm gonna select the rotate Y. And I'm gonna start rotating this a bit toward the position of that pointing foot. And what we can actually do is select these options here up in the channel box. And if I go ahead and choose this here, this sort of smaller kind of pie chart here, the smaller amount there, you can see it kind of highlighted in this blue. That just means that if we were to select in the channel box and middle mouse click in our viewport, we're going to scrub a more incremental amount. So as we scrub, we're, we're able to scrub a smaller amount. You can see if I increase this, now if we scrub, we can try to do a smaller amount, but it's going to increase the increments that it's moving. So if I just bring that back down, we're able to kind of scrub this in smaller increments and get kind of exactly what we want. So I will bring this to around about a value of negative 4.7 or so. We also have this cache in here if we ever need to test this out and try to match it exactly as needed. And then on the rotate X, I'm gonna bring the torso down. Maybe right around here it should work fine. And then I'm going to grab the translate Y. And you can see that a lot of the times as I'm like really trying to go in here and fine tune and pose out a control, a lot of the times I like to use the channel box and just click the channel that I wanna scrub, middle mouse click in my viewport to dial that in rather than selecting the gizmo because you'll see that with the gizmo selection and this mover tool, it is harder to move this a more incremental amount in the viewport we can do it a little bit easier in the channel box. So I'll go ahead and scrub this down. And I'm actually gonna bring the hips down quite a bit because I need to create a wider gate for the foot. And in order to do that, I need to actually bring my hips down. So I think right around here should work. And then I'm gonna go ahead and position the feet a little bit further apart to create a little bit wider of a stance. And I also wanna bring the feet closer together. And I'll probably angle them out just a bit, something like that. All right, and if we want to, we can turn on the cache and see kind of exactly where the foot placement is for a lot of these. 
and I can bring this foot further out. I might actually not want to bring it that far out. We'll actually see. I'll go ahead and bring it out to kind of match the cache there. And then I'll increase the foot roll and bring that foot up. Something like that. All right. That looks good. I go ahead and hide the cache now. And I'm going to select my hip control. And for this, I'm going to take the rotate X and start adjusting this value here. Probably just bring the hips in a little bit. Just right about there along the rotate X. Then I'll grab the rotate Y. And I want to bring, rotate the hips a little bit further toward that leading foot might be a little bit too far so I'll just do something about like this and then on the rotate Z I actually want to bring them down a little bit and kind of point toward that contacting foot because we know as soon as we go into the down position we'll go into a pose like this where the hips shift as that weight kind of plants on that supporting foot so I'll bring this down to right about there you can see we're starting to get kind of a proper pose in here for the hips. Haven't touched the arms yet. I'm not going to worry about those just yet. I kind of want to pose the hips, the main root control. Let's now actually move up to the chest here. So on the chest, I want to go ahead and select the rotate X. And you can see in my reference in the back, we have a pose a bit more hunched over. A little bit more casual type of pose for this contact position. We don't want them kind of leaning really far back. You want it to be in a bit more of a casual position. So I'll probably bring it to probably right around here. And then I'll grab the rotate Z. I might tweak this just a tiny bit to kind of twist his chest over. Probably doesn't need to be much. Something like that should work for us. And then on the rotate Y, I'm going to rotate it this direction in the positive value because we know this arm is going to be what's swinging forward. So that's actually going to drive that chest and have it rotate a bit like that. So I'll probably maybe dial that back a bit, but right around a value of nine there on that. If we want to, we can turn the cache on to look how our kind of pose is coming together. I'll go ahead and turn that off real quick. Something that we might want to do is grab this root control and I'm going to select translate Z. And I think I want to actually bring that pose back just slightly. And if I look at my cache, you can see he's positioned a little bit further back. So something about like that. And we can always adjust it later if we need to. Let's like this foot control here. I think that works. Then I'm going to select this back foot and move it back a little bit further. Bring up that roll control, something about like that. All right, cool. I think that's working decently there. And we might find a little bit later that this gate might actually be a little bit too far apart, but we can always adjust that too pretty easily. Let's go ahead and actually pose out the arms now. And one of the things I want to come in here and grab are the shoulders for this right arm and probably bring them down. Actually, you know what? I probably actually might want to bring them up a little bit. So maybe I'll bring them to around the value of negative two there. And then on the rotate Z, probably bring them forward again because that arm is swinging forward. So I'm going to really bring that shoulder forward. Again, getting a little bit closer to that pose we have in our reference. All right, I think that works pretty decently. And then I'm going to select the arm control here. And this control is actually called the shoulder control, but I kind of consider that the, this is called the scapula control. This is called the shoulder control, but I kind of just sort of consider this the kind of arm, upper arm control, and then the elbow control down here. Um, so I'm going to grab the 
I'm going to take X and maybe bring it out just a bit, something like that. And then I'm going to start bringing it forward as well. So something like that. And then on the rotate Y, I really need to bring the arm down closer to the body so we can grab that and bring it in. To right around there, I might grab that rotate X. Maybe rotate the arm out just a bit. Um, something like this should probably work for us. We can take a look at the cache. You can see we're pretty close to that cache. And then for the elbow control, we typically don't want to rotate like the X value or the Y value. We definitely can if we're doing kind of a bit more kind of polishy aspects of the animation, getting into that kind of polished pass where we can start to mess around with these. But really, you can't actually move your elbow like this. And you can't twist your elbow like this without moving the entire arm. That twist, if you're twisting your elbow, it's actually, you know, coming, it's twisting your wrist, right? But it's also kind of moving and your entire upper arm needs to actually twist as well in order to twist your arm. You can't just twist and rotate your elbow like this in complete isolation from the upper arm. There's going to be a little bit of movement in there. So it is usually a good rule of thumb to, at least when you're first creating your initial poses, to try to keep it the elbow at least just this kind of forward back Z rotation. So I'll go ahead and keep it like that for now. And I don't need much bend on this. So just something like that should probably work for us. And now I want to move to the wrist control. And start bring it in. I want to bring that wrist forward a bit. I think right around there. And then I might just grab the rotate Y and bring that back just a bit. Something like that. And then on the rotate X, I might bring it to right around there. All right, I think that's Working decent. And then let's go ahead and pose out the fingers. Fingers are definitely something I want to make sure that I pose out in the contact position. You don't want to forget forget posing out your fingers. Um, and you don't want to have them in just like this default pose. So I'm going to take the spread on this finger control here. And I'm going to bring that in just because I want to bring the fingers quite a bit closer together because that is a pretty unnatural position for fingers to be in, to have like this really large kind of spread between each fingers. Typically, if we're relaxed and in a more relaxed pose, like a generic walk like this, our fingers actually stay pretty close together just when they're naturally resting. I'm gonna grab the cup control and kind of cup those last two fingers in just a bit get something a bit more kind of natural in that pose. And then now what I want to do is start rotating these fingers a bit again to get them into something that feels a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more natural as far as that pose goes. And I'll probably rotate these fingers in quite a bit selecting all three of the controls and just rotating them all together. Same for this. Rotate that. And then, let's see. That looks pretty decent. I wanna go ahead and bring that thumb in and bring the tip of the thumb out just a bit. 
again, just to get a bit more of a relaxed pose there. Something like this. I think this control can probably be brought back a bit. Some of these fingers might be able to be curled a bit more. Just something like that. Cool. I think that works for now. And we can always tweak those later as well. What I want to do is now focus on the left arm. So for the left arm control, I want to grab the shoulder first because we want to make sure we get that shoulder movement. You don't want to forget the shoulders because they're a big part of the arms movement. I'll grab the rotate Y, probably bring it down. So the shoulder is going to be brought down and then brought pretty far back. So I'll grab the rotate Z and rotate this to really position the shoulders back. It can be easy to just completely overlook the shoulders and only pose out your arm control, but you wanna make sure that you avoid that because anytime you move your arms, you're gonna to have to you know, move your shoulders around. That's just how our body moves, so you wanna make sure you're thinking about that when you're creating this contact position. And then for the arm control, Grab the rotate Y and I want to probably bring it in closer to the body, something like that. And then the rotate Z will really want to bring that arm back quite a bit, something about like that. We definitely don't want to bring it too far back because again, this is sort of just a generic kind of relaxed walk and when we you know, walk in real life, we're not really swinging our arms back and forth, you know, super wide. We don't m move our arms necessarily a ton. We're not moving our, you know, arm like they're not swinging, you know, back and forth like that in just a casual walk. Um, so we want to make sure that we're capturing that. And for the elbow, I might just bring it in slightly. We probably actually don't need to do much on this elbow, keep it really simple. Just a tiny bit of movement there. And for the wrist control, I'm gonna bring that wrist in just a bit. About like that, grab the rotate Z. Bring that wrist in bit closer. Again, just creating a you know pretty relaxed type of pose. I might actually rotate the handle on the x-axis as well, just slightly. And then we'll also just create a another relaxed pose. And what we can actually do if we want to, and I might actually go ahead and just, you know, first pose this out. Obviously, it would be the exact same process as the opposite hand. We can, you know, add some cup to this, reduce the spread, bring the fingers closer together, and start, you know, posing posing these fingers out in a very similar relaxed position, like this. But with Animbot, there is a very powerful tool that we can use to speed up this process. Um, so, I mean, honestly, a pose like this would probably be, be fine. We can, you know, tweak the thumb and quickly get into position. But if you do want to kind of speed up the process even more, what I want to do is select all of these finger controls. I'm going to deselect that wrist control there. And then I'm gonna to go to the mirror option and I'm gonna choose mirror to left. And that will mirror those finger controls and get them basically in the exact same pose as the right hand. And then if we want to, we can refine these a little bit so they're not a, an exact copy. 
once we mirror them across the opposite hand, we can, you know, tweak some of the finger controls. We can maybe bring this, you know, finger out a little bit, just tweak them very slightly, maybe reduce the curl on this finger. Just something like that, just to kind of vary them up a little bit. Now let's go up to the neck control and I'm just gonna grab the rotate Z and I'm going to bring the neck back just a little bit because it felt a little bit too kind of hunched over there. So I'm gonna go into a negative value of about like negative five or so. It should be fine there. And then we also might Rotate the head back just ever so slightly there. All right, so I think we've got the hip positioned where we want overall. I might actually go in here and tweak the translate X value. Maybe just bring it over the contacting foot just a little bit so it's not perfectly in the center because you know, the weight is going to start to shift over this foot at the contact position. So I might move this just a little bit. I think that doesn't need to be that much. Take a look at the cache and you can see we're pretty close to that cache. And it actually looks like in the cache, the hips might actually be over a little bit like that. All right. So I think this we can call pretty much good for now for this contact position. So this is typically the, you know, the amount of time I like to spend on a contact pose. I'm just shifting the rotation of these just a bit to match a little bit closer to that cache that we have to base this cycle on. But now that we've built this contact position, then the rest of the walk is actually going to, you know, really start to come together once we've established this initial, you know, main contact pose for our generic walk cycle. So let's go ahead and just continue on in the next video. All right, so now that we've created our contact position, let's go ahead and create the other two contact poses that we'll need for this walk cycle. So we know that at frame 32, we basically need this exact same pose because we're going back to our left foot contact pose at the end of the animation to actually complete the cycle. And there's a really easy way we can basically copy this pose. And all we need to do is go to frame 32 and press S to lock a keyframe. So basically we've dropped a keyframe down with all the exact same information that is on frame zero. We just press S to lock another keyframe down. So we've basically just locked this same pose at frame 32 and at frame zero. Now we need to create the contact pose for the opposite foot. And we could do that with just the click of a button with Anambot. Now, if you don't have Anambot, what you could do is do the manual approach, which works just fine, but it does take a little bit of time. And I'll kind of show you quickly what that process might look like. So I'll go ahead and select all, select all of my control curves. And I'm just going to lock a keyframe down on 17 as well, just so I have both of these contact positions placed. And now what I need to do is, let's go ahead and select the right foot here and I'm going to copy the control, or excuse me, the translate Z value on the control for the back foot on the right side. And then I'm just going to paste that value on the left foot. So we've pasted the translate Z value. So now they're both placed at the exact same position. And then what we can do is on the pose on frame 16 for this back foot, we can copy the rotate Y value, paste it, but we'll need to go ahead and choose a positive value for that because it is basically the mirrored version. All right, so we basically have this foot completely copied. Now what we can do is on frame 17, we can select the left foot, copy that translate Z value, go to the back foot, paste that translate Z value, go back to this foot on frame 17, copy the roll, go to frame 16 and paste that roll. And you can see now we're getting the same feet placement position there. Um, and then now what we can do is select the rotate Y value, go to this foot, paste it. Obviously you need to add a negative value because we're flipping this. And then we can just move up the body and you can kind of see the process you would take. So with the torso control, we know we still need the exact same height, 
But what we want to do is on the rotate Y value, we want to basically flip this. So we'll take away that negative value to flip it there. The rotate X value can stay the same. And then on the hips, same thing. Take that rotate Y value. I'm going to take away that negative. And then on the rotate Z value, we'll need to do the same thing. So I'm going to take away that negative. And now you can see we're creating the mirrored version of this pose using the manual approach. And I'll go ahead and stop there just to kind of show you the process you would take. You would move up the chain here and flip those values there. Um, but what I'm going to do is go ahead and just delete these again. And then I want to lock a keyframe down again at frame 16. And then with a keyframe there, now what I'm going to do is just going to hit this mirror button. And that's just going to mirror this pose. And you can see how easy that is to mirror this contact position. So now we have the, the exact mirror of that pose. And really Maya should have this exact same function built directly into the software without having to actually download a third party solution. It's kind of such a fundamental thing that the program should have. It's honestly a little crazy that it doesn't have its own built in mirror pose tool. Um, but yeah, I like to use Anabot speeds things up significantly. So now that we have the flipped pose, what we should get is a very rough animation of this movement back and forth. Playback is a little bit slow just because we're seeing the planes in our viewport played out as well, which is making things a little bit slow. So what I might do is go up here to Windows Outliner, select both of my image planes, and I'll just put those on a layer. I'll just call it Reference so that we can hide those when we want to. And there we go. So we've got this basic shuffling back and forth. And now we need to go in here and actually work on creating the other poses for this walk. And the way I like to create walk cycles is to use as much of the information that Maya gives me. So all this blending back and forth between these main key poses, these main contact poses, is actually giving me a lot of really helpful information. And I'll use this information that it's giving me to start to build the poses in between the main contact poses to actually flesh out this walk cycle. Now what I want to do now is open up the graph editor. So I'm going to go to Windows, Animation Editors, and I'm going to pull up the graph editor and I'm going to dock it right above Animbot there. Alright, so I've got my graph editor open. We can go ahead and show our reference again. And now what I want to do is press the All to select all of my keyframes. And then I'm going to go in here and start dropping in the keyframes for the main poses. So we're basically going to have a key pose every four frames. So that means I'm going to go to frame four, which would be my down position. I'm going to press S to lock a keyframe down. Then I'm going to go to frame eight, press S, and then go to frame 12 and press S. So that would be frame four is going to be our down, frame eight is going to be our passing, frame 12 is going to be our up position, and then frame 16 is going to be our next contact position. And I'm going to really focus first on this one step. I want to make sure that's looking decent before I worry really about creating the opposite step. And the first thing that I always do when I'm creating a walk cycle is figure out the up and down motion for the torso. So just figuring out how the hips are going to move up and down and really try to figure out the correct weight and the correct feeling that I want for this section. So what I can do is go into my left view and I can kind of base this roughly on the reference. So on frame four, I'm going to bring the hips down, something like that. And you can see my reference is not 100% exact, but I'm not too worried about that yet. I kind of just want to get the kind of rough up and down information in there. So we know we, the hips go down on frame four for the contact, or excuse me, the down position. And I can also open up the graph editor to see exactly what's happening between my keyframes there with that curve. So on frame eight, what I might do is grab that keyframe and bring it down because it's still going to be kind of easing up at this position. 
And then at frame 12 is going to be the highest point of this walk cycle. It's going to be above the contact position. So I'm gonna bring the hip control on the translate Y up. And I might actually bring this keyframe up now. And I'll go ahead and select the down position here. And I think this value looks pretty good as far as how far the hips actually move down for the lowest point in the walk cycle. So I might go for just something like that. I think that'll work fine. And then I might tweak this keyframe on frame eight for the passing position. And I might bring it down just a tiny bit. Actually, I might bring it up because I might want to have it kind of pop up a little bit faster because if I look at the reference, you can see it actually moves up a little bit faster. So I might go maybe something like that and it'll just get a little bit closer to that last keyframe there. And then on the keyframe on frame 12 for the up position, I'm actually gonna bring this up even higher. Again, you can see on my reference how high the hips actually go there. So I'll do just something about like that and I can clean up that curve and that tangent handle there. So now we get something about like that. And if we want to, we can hide the reference and show the cache to kind of see how close we're actually getting. And that looks pretty good. So now if I play this, we can start to see the movement of the hips there going into the contact position. And it will look a little bit strange because it's really only going through a one step of the cycle here. So we have the down and then the back up. Um, so it looks a little bit strange there exactly what's happening, but we're starting to get some decent information for our walk cycle. And another reason why the, the up and down movement right now feels a little bit sharp is just because, again, like I said, we're focusing on one step. So as the hips move down, they move up, and then they move down into the next contact position, we expect the hips to continue moving down because they're supposed to go into the down position directly after this. But of course we haven't animated that. So the hips kind of just move up and then kind of lock in that next contact position. So when you work in this method of focusing on one step first, just to kind of get the basic foundation of the first step in there and then focus on the up and down movement, the walk might take a little bit to actually start to really take shape in there. But once we actually start to refine the foot movements, that's when we'll actually start to see this first step kind of really start to take shape. And that's what we'll go ahead and do next. We'll begin to actually pose out the feet for the down position, the passing position, and the up position. All right, so now that we've created the basic up and down movement of the torso, let's go ahead and focus real quickly on getting the feet placement kind of roughed in here. So what we can actually do is turn on our cache to kind of see exactly what's happening with our feet here. And we'll actually probably want to make sure that foot is flat on the ground, probably by frame two. And it looks like it's like that in the cache as well because the feet are going to quickly plant on the ground. They're not going to have a really slow ease in to that, you know, flat position. And then something else that we want to do on this left foot is we want to jump to frame eight and make sure the foot roll is also flat on the ground on frame eight. And then it can start to lift off at frame 12. So that looks pretty decent there. And then on this back foot, what we need to actually have happen on this down position is this foot actually needs to continue backward. So what I'm gonna do is gonna grab this foot and just start to translate it back. Something like that. And then obviously that foot roll really needs to be, you know, started to lift, lift off the ground there. And we can also translate the foot down just a little bit. So just to make sure that it is actually on the ground. Because as we move that foot roll, the toe is kind of lifting off the ground as well. So we'll want to fix that. So that foot on frame four is moving backward. So we get this feeling in the down position. So this right foot is still moving backward. This left foot is completely flat on the ground. 
and that's working great. And then we need to move in to our passing position. And I can turn on the cache again to see exactly what's happening. So the left foot should be pretty much directly under our character, which it looks pretty close to that anyway. And that's just based off the blending that Maya is already giving us between these two poses. And I'll kind of roughly place this foot into position. And you can see right now, I'm really only looking at this from the side view. Obviously we'll need to tweak things from the front view as well. Right now, I kind of just want to get the rough sort of back and forth movement of these feet. Just something like that. All right. And then as we move into frame 12, right now, the left foot looks pretty close to how it should be. So then at frame 12, you can see the right foot is already on the ground, which is not what we want. This is when we want to have the foot moving up in that up position, swinging forward, just about to swing down to contact the ground. So that gives us roughly the correct foot movement. And you can see immediately, once we start animating the feet and actually have them you know, planted and lifting off the ground how they should be, this first step in the walk is really starting to take shape here and really starting to come together. Now, one thing you'll notice if I go ahead and pause this real quick and take a look at this left foot, you'll notice that if I turn the cache on, in the cache, the foot is moving further at frame four backward. Same for on frame eight and 12 as well. So something that we need to make sure that we do inside the graph is we need to select this foot control and we need to go into the translate Z, the back and forth value for this foot. And we need to make sure that this curve going from frame zero to frame 16 is a completely linear curve. So we need to make sure our foot is actually sliding on the ground completely linearly so that there's no slow in or slow out, which is what is currently happening with the curve that we have. And the reason we wanna make sure that we have a linear transition on the foot when it's on the ground is because that's going to be really important if we wanna actually translate this walk forward and have this walk actually move forward in 3D space and not just be this sort of treadmill type of walk cycle. And that's important to make sure that you do and we'll need to make sure that we have this foot to have a linear transition. And it's obviously a lot easier to build your walk cycles first starting out in this kind of treadmill walk where you're not having to worry about actually animating the character forward in space. So we can just really figure out the mechanics of the walk. And then later on, we can actually translate this walk forward. But in order to actually translate it forward, we need to make sure we have a few things in place. And number one on that list is grabbing all of these keyframes here. And we can just delete them. And then we can select this first keyframe and I'm gonna break the tangent. And then I'm gonna change this tangent to a linear tangent. And then I'm gonna grab the keyframe at frame 16. I'm gonna break that tangent handle, select the one on the left and make a linear tangent for that. So now that foot is sliding backwards with even spacing. There's no slow in or slow out, which is exactly what we want. So there we go. So now we've got that foot moving how it should on the ground. We can go ahead and hide that cache and that's really starting to come together. There's obviously some knee popping that we'll need to iron out. And that also comes in with, you know, tweaking, tweaking the hips as well. But what I'm gonna do is go into my perspective view and I wanna take a look and make sure there's not some weird issues happening. And one issue I'm immediately seeing is the sliding on the ground along the X axis, which is definitely not what we want. I can turn on the cache to see exactly what's happening. And this foot is actually going to be kind of basically staying where it's at. And then as it swings forward, it looks like it's actually going to move out a bit away from the other foot to give the foot kind of room to move, move across without hitting the other foot. And then same here, it's going to blend back into the position on frame 16. So that gives us something a little bit closer there to what we'd want. I think this forward movement, we might be able to dial that back just a little bit. And something else I need to make sure I tweak in here is that I need to 
make sure this foot roll is working properly because what's happening is that on this foot roll, we have it moving up as the foot is peeling off the ground. It looks like we can actually probably translate this foot a little bit further back. So that heel is lifting off and then at frame eight, the heel is almost at a value of zero. But we actually want to keep a little bit of foot roll in this. And we need to be able to balance the rotation of this foot with the heel roll so that it's working just a little bit better. Because right now, it has this sort of pop, like that heel roll is zeroing out really quickly. So it's bringing our foot into this pose. And it gives us almost like a little bit of a snappy jerky feeling on that foot roll and the foot lifting up. So what I'm gonna try is maybe increase that foot roll just a little bit and then see if I can dial back the rotation on this foot. Maybe reduce the height. And it's starting to look a little bit better. And what I probably want to fix now is the toe control. And it looks like we actually have a value on this. So what I'm going to do is zero this out. And I might need to actually rotate this in to create a bit, of, a bit more of a flat kind of foot there by tweaking that toe roll. And then maybe it's definitely looking closer to reference there. So something like that. I think we actually have a little bit of toe roll on this, on that contact. So what I'm gonna do is zero, zero it out when the foot is completely flat on the ground. Make sure we don't have any of that toe roll there. All right, so we've got the legs kind of roughly moving how they should be so that's kind of working so what i want to do now is really quickly get some side to side movement on the hips so this is the curve that we currently have as maya kind of blends between these two contact positions but what we want to actually happen is that definitely by frame eight the hips should be more over this supporting leg because this leg is now completely off the ground, so all the weight is being supported by the left leg, and that means the hips need to shift over toward that position. So I'm gonna really bring the hips over to right around there, and then we can grab this keyframe and move it up as well. So the hips are now moving over to the side, and then at frame 12, we can grab this keyframe make sure it's working a bit better and it will look obviously a little bit strange right now because we don't have that next step in there but we're starting to get a little bit better side to side movement on the hips all right that's working nicely so now that we have kind of the basic mechanics of what the legs should do and obviously they're still a little bit rough but we have sort of the you know the lift off position we have the right foot moving roughly how it should stepping through here. We have that left foot moving nice and linearly on the floor there. Let's go ahead and just continue on by fleshing out the rest of the character. So working on the chest a bit, and then we can start thinking about some of that arm movement as well. So we'll go ahead and do that next. All right, let's just go ahead and continue fleshing out the generic walk cycle here. So what I wanna do is select my torso control, and I wanna work a little bit on the rotate x value kind of this forward backward motion on the the chest here on this main kind of torso and what i might actually try in this is i might try to actually bring this down a bit and what i'm thinking is i'll probably be countering just a bit with the upper chest control so the chest might be moving back slightly a little bit of rotation in there on the chest moving backward to frame eight. And then it'll continue kind of rotating forward to the position it has 
at frame 16. So it's going to be, I might try just a very simple, simple curve like this so that chest is kind of moving back a little bit. And we'll probably want to get quite a bit of the rotation from this spine control here up at the top. And then what we can do is take a look at the rotate Y value. And this should generally be giving us what we want. Again, Maya just blending between the main contact positions will create like a nice transition for the, you know, rotation and the twisting on the, the torso there. And what I want to take a look at now is the, the rotation on the hip and mainly the rotate Z value. Because as I mentioned, when we're looking at some of the, you know, real world reference here, as we shift our hips and our weight over the supporting leg, the hips are going to quickly shift up in that position. They're not going to drop downward to lift up the right leg in this position. So at this pose, we wouldn't want our hips like this as we're lifting the right leg off the ground. We want our hips more like that as all the weight is transitioned onto the left leg. So I'm gonna go to probably frame four and I'm gonna start to shift, shift this up quite a bit. So I'm probably gonna go to something about like that. And we might end up retiming this a bit, but I'm not gonna worry about retiming it just yet. I wanna wait and make sure that I've got kind of everything working at least on the current frames they're at. So when I'm making a walk cycle like this, I also like to build as much as I can using this timing right here without shifting specific parts of the body around and shift different movements on the body at different timing because I wanna make sure that I can keep things simple and I don't really wanna start you know, offsetting controls until I'm in a bit more of the kind of polishy stages of this animation. So looking at this and the hips shifting over, I may wanna actually move this to frame three and have the hips really shift over a little bit faster. But I also don't wanna start, you know, offsetting individual controls just yet. I wanna make sure that I can get things looking decent where I have this nice kind of even timing where I have the, you know, the down position on four, the passing on eight and the up on 12. So I'm gonna kind of keep that timing for now. And then later on, I'll probably start kind of offsetting some of these controls here. So at frame eight, I'm going to bring this up quite a bit. So maybe right around here or so. So we're starting to get better, better movement on the hips there and a little bit more correct as far as the mechanics of a walk. And then at frame 12, We'll probably grab this keyframe and move it up as well because it's not going to start shifting back until it gets into that contact position. So maybe something about like that should work. So that's kind of the rough movement of the hips. Again, it's going to look a little bit strange because we've only got it working on one step. But again, I like to work this way because I can later on just mirror this side of the step for the opposite foot and get a lot of this information for free that we've already animated. All right, that's working pretty decent. Let's jump into the rotate X. And also by default, again, because the nature of the movement on the rotate Y, this kind of back and forth twisting as the leg swing swings forward, the blending that Maya is giving us between these two contact poses should give us decent results without doing much tweaking, at least right now. So we can kind of just focus on the, the rotate Z and the rotate X for the hip controls. So on the rotate X value, I'll probably grab this keyframe on frame four and I'll start moving it down just a bit like that as the hips kind of compress inward moving into that down position. So something like that. And it'll be a little bit subtle here. And then I'll go to frame eight. I'll probably just bring this down a bit. Actually, I think I will probably still want this compressing a bit more. Just looking at this. So I might bring this up a little bit to maybe around a value of negative one 
one or two. So let's grab the keyframe on frame eight and I'll probably just drag this up a bit. About like that. And then on frame 12, I'm probably gonna do the same thing. So I'm probably gonna drag it up even more and have the hips kind of rotate backward. So probably something about like that. You can tweak that curve. So we'll get you know the hips kind of compressing down and then rotating back as that hip kind of swings forward or that leg kind of swings forward there. All right, that's looking decent there. So now that we've tweaked the hips, the torso a bit, let's go ahead and focus on the actual spine control here, this IK spine control. And I'm first gonna take a look at the rotate X. So I'll go ahead and select rotate X and then I'll come in here and probably on frame eight, I'll just grab this and start to rotate the chest forward. About like that. And then I'll grab the keyframe on frame four and just make that kind of just a transition like that. So the hips compress down in that down position all the way through the passing position. And then on the up position is when they'll start to rotate back to where it needs to be on that next contact. So we'll get just a basic kind of compression on the chest there. All right. It's looking decent. Now let's grab the rotate Z value and take a look at this. And I think on this, I'll grab the keyframe on frame eight and I'm gonna bring that down quite a bit to maybe around a value of negative two or so, something like that. Because I want the chest rotate and compress that direction there. So I'll grab the keyframe on frame four and I'm just gonna bring that down, something like that. And then the keyframe on frame 12, I'll bring that down and create kind of this transition on the chest. So something about like that, kind of get a little bit of that compression in there. And obviously the reason we wanna do this as well is if you remember when looking at the reference the real life reference, typically when we're walking, our weight is transitioned on that supporting foot and our hip rotates that direction. Looking at this line of the rotate Y value there, right in the center of this rotate gizmo, that's the kind of direction we want on our hips. And then that chest is generally going to counter that rotation. So we get basically the opposite rotation there. And that's kind of what we're creating on the rotate Z value, that kind of opposite movement of the hips. So the chest kind of compresses this way as the weight is transitioned on that left foot and then the hips transition this way as that weight is planted on that left foot. So we get kind of basic movement like that. And if I select this chest control, we can look at the rotate Y, but I think right now just this kind of general transition between both of these keyframes should be decent for now. So if I play this first step, again, just trying to ignore past that first initial step there, you can start to kind of see this walk cycle take shape. Now, obviously we haven't animated or done anything with the arms yet. They're just transitioning back and forth between those main key poses. And Maya's kind of just doing its blending between those, those two poses there. But what I like to do when I'm animating the arms is that's when I like to actually go in and mirror this animation to create the opposite step. So we've kind of done a lot of the heavy lifting on this initial first step. We've got the basic you know, foot movement down, we've got the basic up and down of the hips, the side to side. And now what we can do next is we'll actually go through the process of, of flipping this cycle for the opposite step, and then we'll go through and actually animate the arms because I find it a little bit easier to animate the arms when I see the cycle as a whole, because that's also when I might start to shift some of the timing around on the arms to create the correct feeling of, you know, the overlapping movement on the arms. And sometimes you do need to kind of shift your timing around to achieve that. So this is the point in the cycle when I typically start thinking about wanting to actually mirror this to create the opposite step. So that's what we'll go ahead and do next.
All right, so before we actually mirror our walk cycle, something that I forgot to do was animate a bit of the neck and the head. So let's go ahead and do that real quickly. I'm just going to select the neck control and I wanna to go to the rotate Z value. And I wanna make a few tweaks to this. And something I think I wanna try here. And if I look at the cache, we can probably see it doing something a bit similar to this that I'm thinking where I need to kind of counter the neck rotation because the chest is rotating forward. I don't want the head to rotate that far forward. So in order to fix that, we kind of need to just counter animate a bit of the neck movement. So what I might do is just go to frame four and rotate the neck control back to something about like this, just so it kind of keeps the head from rotating too far forward that early. So we're kind of countering that movement and then it'll kind of come forward and drop forward, almost getting a little bit of overlap between the neck moving forward and the chest rotating. So you can see by just bringing the keyframe on frame four down, we're able to get a little bit of overlap and then on frame eight, what I can probably do is just bring a few of these keyframes down and just let it transition back up to the, the position it's at on frame 16. So we get a little bit of that type of motion there. And actually something that I need to fix here, just noticing what's happening as I scrub this, when I did the mirror operation, it's flipping the rotate Z value because typically it's just the way this mesh or this rig is set up that rotate Z is the forward and back movement where typically if I like chest select the chest control, that would be the rotate X value. So typically that forward and back movement wouldn't be mirrored because you're just animating forward and backward, but it's the things like the rotate Z value and the rotate Y value is what would be mirrored. But since the forward and back function on this net control is on the rotate Z value, it basically just mirrored this value to go into positive uh, 5.8. And then you can see on frame zero, it's at negative. So we're getting this like kind of hunched down neck pose, which we definitely don't want. So I need to make a few tweaks. I'm gonna select the value at frame zero, copy that, paste it on frame 16. All right, and I think this value should still be good here. And then transition to here. So I might just go ahead and delete these these keyframes here just to simplify this curve. So we get something like that. And I think that should give us what, what we want there. All right, and now let's select the head control and I want to go to the rotate Z value and we probably will get something similar on this control. It's flipping that value, which we don't actually want. So what I want to do is copy the value on frame zero, paste it here, and then I'll go ahead and paste that same value for the rest of the keyframes. And then I'll go ahead and tweak these keyframes as needed. So I'll grab this keyframe and I'll move it down just a little bit. So we're getting a little bit of drag in the head in this first step going into that down position. So we have a little bit of just drag in the head And then I'll grab this keyframe, maybe move it up a little bit, because this is where the head is gonna start to rotate down going into the passing position. So I'll bring it up just right around there. And then I'll probably grab this keyframe on frame 12 and bring that keyframe up so that it's holding this rotation down and then it starts to rotate back into that contact position. So just something like that. So we just get a little bit of kind of overlap on the head there. All right. And we can jump into the front view here. Then I might grab the rotate Y value for this and I'll probably bring it down I'm not sure if I want to bring it that far down. 
Actually, I'll go ahead and probably maybe exaggerate that rotation. And I might end up shifting these, these keyframes around later on once we actually mirror the cycle to create a bit more of overlap. But I do kind of like having that head kind of drift over in that direction. And honestly, we could probably see what's happening in the, the cache or in the video reference, but I'm kind of at the point of the cycle where I'm kind of not necessarily going directly off of what's happening in the cache, but it does look like that's how that animation for the cache, how I animated that cache animation. It's kind of similar setup where that head dips down. And we can just go to frame eight and I might still have it kind of rotated that direction a bit. Kind of gets a little bit more kind of slightly a bit more kind of attitude in the walk with that head kind of dipping down that direction. And then I'll grab this keyframe and probably just bring it down to kind of ease it into the keyframe on frame 16. So we get something like that. And that might be too much, but I think I'll probably just keep it like that for now until we can actually see how this is looking with the full cycle going. And that's what we can go ahead and do right now. So let's actually go ahead, now that we've got some rough kind of neck and head animation in there, let's actually go ahead and mirror the cycle for the opposite foot. So what I'm gonna do is I like to kind of do this just one keyframe at a time and just mirror that pose. So what I'll do is go ahead and select all, select all of my control curves, and then I'm going to copy the pose on frame four, that down position. I'm gonna to go to frame 20. I'm gonna paste it and then choose the mirror option to just flip that pose. So we've created the mirror of that pose. And I think we're gonna probably run into the same issue with just the neck position between these, since it's mirroring the rotate Z value that the neck and the head rotate Z might be a little bit different, but I think everything else will work. So we'll go ahead and go to frame eight. I'll copy that, go to frame 24, I'll paste it, and then I'll mirror it to create the flipped version of that. All right, that's all looking good there. Let's go to frame 12 copy that pose by using this button right here, go to frame 28, paste it, and then hit the mirror button to flip that. So now if we play it, the neck and the head might be a little bit off. Yeah, we get that big little dip down, but everything else you can see is really coming together now that we've actually just mirrored that step, created the opposite step for this, and now you can see this walk cycle is really kind of starting to come together there. So let's go ahead and fix that, that neck issue real quick. So I'm gonna go to my rotate Z and let's see. So for this should be pretty simple. What I wanna do is take the value on frame four. I'm gonna copy it, go to frame 20, which is the down position for the opposite foot. I'm going to paste that value and then I'll delete these keyframes. And now you can see we get that same kind of action going into the next step. And then I'll select the head control to make sure I fix that. All right, so I'm gonna to go to frame 20. I wanna copy the value on frame four, go to frame 20, paste that value. And then go to frame eight, copy that value, go to frame 24, make sure it's similar there. All right, that looks good. I'm gonna copy the value on frame 12, and go to frame 28 and paste it. So something like that should work. All right, that definitely works quite a bit better there. So you should be able to see how much time we're able to save utilizing a mirror tool like this, like Anambot has, where we can really focus on creating the mechanics for just the first step and then going through the process of copying the pose and then mirroring it to create the step for the opposite leg. And now you can see our walk cycle is really beginning to take shape and really beginning to kind of actually start to feel like a proper walk cycle. So now that we've got it mirrored, 
what I want to do is go forward and start to tweak the graph editor a little bit and make sure we're getting a nice smooth cycle. Make sure all of these curves are flowing nicely together so that as we go into the cycle, we're not getting any strange kind of hitches or hiccups, which is what I see a little bit here in the cycle. There's a few small little hiccups and things happening now that we've mirrored it. So we can go into the graph editor and start refining things. So let's go ahead and do that next. All right, so now what I wanna do is go through the process of making sure our walk cycle is looping properly. And to do this, we need to do a little bit of work inside the graph editor. So the first thing that I wanna do is select all of my control curves. So I go ahead and just select my selection set there. And then inside the graph editor, I wanna select all of those keyframes and then go up to curves, pre-infinity cycle, post-infinity cycle, to cycle those keyframes. And if you don't actually see your cycled curves in the graph editor, you wanna make sure that you go up to view and turn on infinity. If that's unchecked, you can see you won't actually see those cycling curves. So you wanna make sure that that's turned on. All right, so now that we've done that, I wanna zoom in on one of the control curves to kind of show you an issue you'll commonly run in when creating a cycle. So I'm gonna select the chest control here and I'll select the rotate X. So this rotate X value, the curve should look something pretty similar to something like, you know, that bouncing ball type of curve. It's a simple curve. We have, you know, the value at frame 16, then the value, you know, increases up to frame 24 and then back down to frame 32. So this is a pretty simple curve that we've got going on for the rotate X on the chest. And we can select the rotate Y and we should see something pretty similar, just a very simple curve flowing through here. Now, if we select the rotate Z value, we're going to get this strange kind of hitch in the animation and in this curve. So with the transition that we're creating on the rotate Z, we would want to have this curve, you know, flowing nicely from frame 32 to frame zero and just continuing on with a nice smooth curve. But these tangent handles at the beginning of our animation, the first and last keyframe, they're going to be set to auto tangent. That's the tangent handles I'm using inside of Maya. So that's going to flatten out these curves and it'll create a small issue where as we end this animation with that tangent handle being flat, means that animation, the spacing is getting closer and closer together. The rotation is kind of slowing down as it gets to the end of the animation. And then once it hits frame zero, it's slowing out of that rotation and continuing on that path. So this is not something that we would want. This is going to create a small little hiccup or issue in the animation where the rotation suddenly feels like it slows down and speeds back up. Now, if you're looking at this on one single control curve, it might be you know kind of hard to spot that specific issue, but with this happening across many different control curves on our character, things like the hips and you know maybe things like the, the chest, or the, the head area, those issues kind of compound and you know it just adds adds issues to the overall animation and those small little tiny little hiccups in each individual control is just going to compound when it's across you know multiple different controls and you're gonna have these really small little issues in the animation. So what we want to do for issues like this where we have this you know flat tangent, we want to make sure that this tangent handle is you know, continuing the path that we want for the curve. So we just need to rotate this tangent handle up and kind of point to that keyframe. And then same on the first tangent handle. We wanna to point to the keyframe next. So now we've created a nice smooth transition throughout this curve. So now we've created a nice smooth cycle on the rotate Z value. Now, one thing we could do is if I select these keyframes again and change them back to the auto so that they go back to their default you know, orientation, we could change these to spline tangents. And you can see a spline tangent will give you that you know, proper flow of the curve. But it is important to point out that we couldn't just do this you know, across all of our control curves and across all of our channels. So if I select the, the chest control, and maybe I wanna do that for all the rotation values. So I'll come in here and select the first and last keyframe for all of these channels. And I change the first and last keyframe all to spline tangent. It's going to work for the rotate Z value, but things like the rotate X and the rotate Y, it's 
you know, the tangent handle is pointing toward the next keyframe. So if I go to right state Y, it's creating this strange, you know, issue on this curve now, if this is changed to a, ta to a spline tangent. So there are definitely, you know, curves or channels where you would typically want an auto tangent, that flat curve, that sort of bouncing ball shape to that curve. We wouldn't want a spline tangent on this curve. We would want something like the auto tangent. So if I change this back to auto, we're creating a nice smooth transition. And for the rotate X, you can see the issue that this is causing. This is gonna create a very strange sharpness to that curve on the rotation. So this is an issue where we wanna go back and switch this to auto. So unfortunately, we will have to go through here and tweak some of these, these tangent handles sort of one by one. And I'll go ahead and move through here quickly. So I'll select the hip control, the rotate X for this. Got to have a little bit of issue there. So we'll just select these tangent handles and just rotate them till we're getting a nice smooth curve through that. Rotate Y looks fine, rotate Z. We can fix these again to create a nice smooth transition there. We can select the translate X on the root control. The side to side, we wanna make sure that this is a nice flowing smooth curve. So we'll adjust that tangent handle just to smooth out that transition a bit. Same for the translate Y. This is causing some issues there. So we'll want to make sure that we adjust this tangent handle. Translate Z, which is this forward and back, which honestly this change we don't really need right now. So I'll go ahead and just delete these keyframes and just keep it a flat tangent, or excuse me, a flat channel there and a flat curve. Rotate X looks decent. Rotate Z, that's fine. And go ahead and select the foot control and see if there's any issues with some of the translation happening. I think that looks fine. One issue I know that we're going to have that we need to fix, that we can go ahead and fix right now is that the side to side movement on the translate X value, as soon as that foot hits the ground, we don't want this sliding to actually happen. The foot shouldn't be able to slide left and right like this if our weight is on this foot. So what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and select this keyframe here. I'm gonna copy that value and paste it all the way to this keyframe here. All of those keyframes to make sure that that foot is flat on that ground. There's no sliding left and right until it lifts up and then we can get a little bit of that nice uh, transition on that foot. Same for this foot. I wanna go in here and clean up this translate X curve. So let's go ahead and take Let's see here. So this value we want to keep. We might actually go ahead and take this keyframe when that foot hits the ground on that translate X value and see what happens if we like that change if we paste it across to these keyframes as well. Something like that. I think that works pretty well. The foot might be a little bit too wide there. So I might select all these keyframes and shift up a little bit just to bring that foot a little bit closer inward. Again, we just wanna make sure our foot is nice and flat. That side to side movement is nice and flat. I'm gonna select that left foot again and then move through some of these controls here. Translate Z is working fine because we wanna have a linear transition there. Rotate X. That's fine for now. This rotate Y, we can try to adjust this a little bit. Won't get the most perfect curve there. And this is actually honestly one where once it hits this rotation, we might want to just keep it there as well until it actually lifts off the ground. Let's actually try that. Let's copy this value and see how it looks if we just paste it here and keep that same rotation. And I think that works well, and then we can have it kind of rotate and do the rotation that it's doing through here. And we can actually change this back to auto. Yeah, we just wanna make sure that whenever we have weight on the foot like this, there shouldn't be any like continual rotation as the foot is actually completely flat on the ground because all of our weight is going to be on that foot. We're not gonna be able to really shift our foot around. It's gonna to need to stay in that same rotation. So I wanna do the same on this foot on the rotate Y. So once it gets 
to this rotation. I'll go ahead and copy that value, paste it all through the end of the animation, and then paste it here as well at the beginning of the animation. So we should get something about like that. And if we want to, we can increase the amount that that foot is rotated maybe by a little bit by just bringing this value down on all of these keyframes. Something like that. Nice, and I think that works decently. Let's go ahead and just continue on now on this foot, making sure it's flowing nicely. And these feet should be you know, pretty simple as far as how they're actually flowing through here. All right, that looks good. Let's quickly select the neck control. There shouldn't really be any. We kept the rotation on this control pretty minimal on that neck. Let's go ahead and select the rotate Y and fix this. You need to make sure that this is a nice smooth transition there as well. This keyframe might need to be brought up a little bit just to maintain a little bit smoother of a curve there. Same for here, there's just a small little few hiccups I'm seeing in this curve. Let's go to the rotate Z, clean this up a bit. This one should be pretty simple to clean up. All right, that looks good. And we haven't really done any animation really on the arms yet, so these should be fine. Probably gonna actually go through the process of getting some arm animation in there next. I did notice this hitch happening in this foot, and that's just because we haven't changed this to a linear tangent on this foot sliding back. So if I select my left foot, you can see that this movement is what we would want here. So then on this foot, I need to make sure we have that similar. So once it plants on the ground, it should be completely linear across this entire transition. So I'm gonna delete these three keyframes. I'm gonna select the top keyframe, break the tangent handle, select the tangent handle on the right, change that to a linear tangent. Same here, I'll break that tangent handle, change that to linear. And then coming out, the foot is also kind of lifting up. So that doesn't need to be linear there, but we can create a nice smooth transition. So that should work better on this foot now. So I think for the most part, our curves should be flowing nicely through all of these controls here. We smoothed all of that, that information out. What I actually wanna do now just real quickly noticing here is that we can go ahead and fix the foot plants just real quickly on these steps. So as the foot is planted on the ground, this foot roll takes basically four frames to go completely flat on the ground. So frame zero to frame four. Really this plant should happen much faster because all that weight is coming down on that foot. We shouldn't have this slow moving rotation happening on that foot. Let's go ahead and try to go to frame two and zero out this roll value. So it plants much faster, and it could be something where we might be able to just go to frame one and just plant it in one frame. But for now, I'll go ahead and make that a two frame transition, and then same on this foot. At frame 18, we need to make sure that that foot is completely flat on the ground. Just to give the feet a bit more weight, they're not having that really slow rotation on the foot roll, and the plants feel like they have a lot more weight to them. Uh, looking at this now from this front view again, I feel like this left foot, all these bottom keyframes can be brought in just a tiny bit more. Because again, in like a generic walk like this, the feet are typically, we keep our feet pretty close together when we're walking. Like our feet come really close to actually hitting each other as we go through the steps. Same with the height and the steps on the feet. We need to make sure that you know the height is not too much. We typically keep our feet really close to the ground as we go through our steps. We don't like lift our feet really high. It takes way too much energy, especially if we're trying to capture a more kind of generic walk. All right, so at this stage, we've created a nice you know, smooth cycle throughout this entire step here, both of these steps. And really one of the last things that we need to go in here and do is actually go in and animate the arms. So let's go ahead and do that next and begin creating some nice overlap for the arms. 
Now let's go ahead and begin animating the arms for this walk cycle. So right now the arms are just moving back and forth basically from you know the first contact to the contact on the opposite foot and continuing forward. But we wanna add a little bit of overlap and just some more movement and interest in the actual transition here. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is select my arm control. And if I actually go into the shoulder real quick, at least right now, the general movement that we're getting from the shoulder, basically the transition that Maya is giving us from frame zero to frame 16, and then back to frame 32 is pretty decent movement right off the bat. If we select each one of these keyframes, you can see what each one does. There might be a few that we can adjust. Maybe here we can you know, bring this keyframe up a little bit to create kind of a sharper downward movement on the shoulder. But I think for right now, this kind of general nice transition between these two contact positions should, should give us some decent results. So we'll go ahead and keep that there for now. And then I wanna just focus on first animating this upper arm control. So what I wanna do is select the rotate Z which is basically this back and forth of the hand or the arm there. And on this, once our character moves into the down position, I actually want to rotate the arm upward. So rather than just immediately swinging it back, I wanna get a little bit of overlap. So the body is moving down, but the movement of the arm is actually continuing forward. So we'll get a nice feeling of offset in that movement as well, which will feel nice and might not need to be that far up. Maybe just something like that should work. Just a little bit of rotation, continual rotation forward on that movement. And then I might just want to clean up this curve here and probably grab this keyframe. And I want to move it up as well because I don't want it to shoot down quite as fast. So what's happening is we're rotating the arm forward and then when this keyframe being so low, it's going to quickly move backward through the passing position. But I want to go ahead and bring this keyframe up about like that to more kind of ease out of this rotation. And then the keyframe on frame 12, I want to grab this and also bring it up about like that. We might actually bring this other keyframe up a little bit. So we're getting some nice movement in that arm as it kind of still continues forward before moving backward. All right, I think that's working pretty well. Now what I wanna do on frame 16 is I actually want to bring this up just a tiny bit, not too far like that, and this is the point, especially on the arms like this, where I'm not creating you know, a perfect mirror on this cycle, because we wanna have something very similar happen on you know, the arm moving back to the next contact position. So what I mean by that is, as we go down into this down position, on frame 20, I actually wanna grab this keyframe and move it down something like that. So now we're really actually offsetting this movement from the rest of the cycle. And this is the part where it's much easier to do this when you see your entire cycle happening here. We have, you know, both steps happening there. Before we were focusing on just one step, but I knew that typically with arms is where you really start to get, you know, those offset keyframes in there and really start to add that overlap, which is much easier to do when you have your entire animation cycled here. So we'll bring this right around there at frame 20, then I'll jump to frame 24. I'll select this keyframe and we just wanna make sure that we're creating a better transition here, about like that. And then we'll grab this keyframe, probably wanna move that down as well, something a bit more like that. And then we'll wanna make sure that we smooth out this transition there. All right, and I think that should work pretty decently there on this arm. And I think we've got some nice flow through all of this happening now. You can already start to see just by adding and tweaking the rotate Z value on the arm, we're getting some really nice offset happening in there. All right, now let's go ahead and do the same for the elbow here. So I'm gonna select that and go to rotate Z. And I wanna do something pretty similar to what we just did. So I'm going to grab the keyframe on frame four and I wanna move it up to right around here so that elbow is also going to rotate forward 
And I actually want to continue that rotation forward. So I'm going to grab the keyframe on frame eight and move that up as well. Probably to right around there because we want to get some drag on that elbow. And then at frame 12, we can start to bring it down about like that. Then we can grab the keyframe on frame 16. We want to bring that up, be about like that. Kind of looking at it in the viewport as well to see how much rotation we're getting in that keyframe. And then at frame 20 here, I think this value might actually be pretty decent how much that elbow is actually rotated right there. Maybe something like that. We can bring it down just a bit. And then at frame 24, we need to drag the elbow. So I'm going to start bringing it down. Probably get into the negative value just a little bit there. Maybe right around there. We don't want to drag it too far because we don't want to get kind of a broken elbow. We could always push it if we want to. But I'll keep it a little bit subtle for now. And then this keyframe, at frame 28, we can probably just you know, bring it down to kind of smooth out that, that transition there. So we get something about like this. Make sure we've got a decent kind of smooth curve flowing through here. All right, and then we can see how this looks. Nice, and I think that's working pretty well. We can, if we want to, try to maybe increase the drag on the elbow. So maybe bring this keyframe down just a little bit here. Maybe bring this keyframe down. Just to maybe play around with that kind of drag happening on the elbow there. I think something like that works pretty well. All right, so now that we've got the basic kind of back and forth happening on the arm, let's actually go ahead and in the next video, we'll actually go through the process of tweaking the rest of the arm just to make sure it's flowing kind of nicely through here. I think the in and out movement on the arm right now, mainly on the rotate Y, might be a little bit too much, so we can go in and tweak that. So let's go ahead and just continue on animating the right arm in the next video. All right, let's go ahead and finish animating the right arm in this video. So we left off mainly animating the back and forth and adding a bit of overlap to the elbow. So let's go ahead and select the upper arm control and I'm gonna go into my rotate Y and we have a bit of basic rotation just based off of the two contact positions. So the contact at zero and the contact at 16. So we basically just have a transition between those two contact points. And for the most part, we're getting decent results, but the main thing I'm feeling is that the arm is just swaying too far out and possibly too far in. You can see the fingers are actually brushing the leg there through the step. So I still wanna have this kind of circular motion on the arm, but I really wanna reduce it to something a bit smaller. So let's go ahead and just adjust the keyframes here on this rotate Y curve. So what I'll do is select the keyframe on frame four, and I'm probably gonna bring it down quite a bit. Cause again, I wanna reduce the amount that the arm is actually swinging inward there. So something like that should work. And then what we can do is jump to frame eight and I'll grab this keyframe and I'll begin to drag it down. And I actually want to drag it lower than the keyframe on frame four, maybe right around here. I'm again, looking in the viewport to see where this is actually kind of placed. So I think something like that should work. Again, the arm is just not swinging quite as close to the body there. And now what we can do is jump to frame 12 and I'll bring this keyframe down, probably right around there. So the arm is starting to swing out, as you can see here, away from the body as I bring this keyframe up there. And I'll jump to frame 16 and I'll bring this keyframe down. I think something like that, kind of just making more of an even kind of transition here. 
as that arm is swinging back out. So as I bring this keyframe up, you can see during the part where the arm is swinging back out, the higher I bring this keyframe, the closer it's going to be to that body. So I'm kind of just reducing that circular motion as the arm is swinging out. And we can jump to frame 20 and might bring this keyframe up just a tiny bit. Again, looking at how far this is actually transitioning outward there. And it might be a little bit too much, but I'll go ahead and just keep it there for now. And now let's go ahead and select the keyframe on frame 24 and we'll want to bring this up to maybe around there, just continuing this upward motion on the curve here. Again, the higher I bring it up, the closer this arm is swinging toward the body. So we're, again, we're just reducing the amount of back and forth kind of swaying motion on the rotate Y there. And I might bring that up just a little bit more something like that. And then we can jump to the keyframe on 28 and I'll bring that up to create this transition going into the end keyframe. And then of course we'll want to grab this tangent handle and tweak that curve to create a smoother transition between, between these two key poses at the beginning and the end there. And again, I think that's already working better. Just reducing that the swaying back and forth, that circular motion. We still have that very similar circular motion, but it's just a little bit tighter and the arm is not swinging as close to the leg and then as far out of the body. And we might be able to grab this tangent handle and just rotate it a bit to create a smoother transition between this keyframe, the keyframe before on frame four and then the keyframe after. All right, I think this is looking pretty good on the right arm there for the rotate Y. Let's go ahead and do something similar to the rotate X on this right arm. Again, we're just getting this transition between the two keyframes there. Let's go ahead and grab the keyframe on frame four. And I'm probably gonna bring it down quite a bit because I actually want the arm to kind of rotate inward. You can see the type of rotation that the rotate X is giving us. So I might bring this down quite a ways there into the negative value to really bring that arm again, kind of rotating in. And then we can go to keyframe on frame eight. I'm going to bring this down even lower to kind of continue that rotation in toward the body as the arm is actually transitioning back. So just something like that. And this is going to be pretty subtle rotation, but, but it will add some kind of looseness to this transition. And then I want to go to frame 12 and bring this down to where we're kind of getting a bit of kind of an ease in to this movement here before the arm actually starts to rotate back out. So something like that should work. Let's jump to frame 16 and then we'll want to grab this keyframe and bring it down to where we're creating a nice transition between these. I might bring it up just a bit. Again, looking at the viewport there, kind of the transition we're getting. And you can see the, the, the movement that that creates for the arm. As we bring this keyframe up, the arm is actually rotating outward and we're getting this nice kind of rotation on the arm as the arm starts to move into that down position. And let's go to frame 20. We can bring this keyframe up quite a bit. And as the arm is actually swinging back forward toward the front of the body. So it's, we have the arm moving backwards and then it starts to move forwards. And then on this transition, frame 16 to 20, we want to, we want to continue this arm rotating out. So something like that should work. And we are creating a pretty similar curve to what we created on the rotate Y channel as well. So as the arm is moving forward, I'm going to grab the keyframe on frame 24 and start to transition that up because I still want to have this arm 
moving out in this whole section. So something like that. And then we'll get that nice rotation inward through here. So at frame 28, we can bring this keyframe up to right around there. And then we'll just want to transition, make sure we have this transition nice and smooth between these two keyframes. So something like that. We can play this and see. So you can see we're starting to get some nice swaying back and forth movement there. And my PC seems to be running a little bit slow right now. Not exactly sure why. So currently you can see my frames per second there on the bottom right. If you want to see that in your view, you can go to display, heads up, heads up display, and then do frame rate to see the frame counter, the actual frame rate you're getting while you're playing your animation. So currently we're getting about 15 frames per second when playing our animation in the viewport. And we're animating at 30 frames per second. So obviously we're not getting real time playback. But what we can do is come down here if we want to and select this cache playback. So that will actually cache the playback and then we'll be able to get a more real time view. You can see now in the viewport we're hitting consistently around 29 to 30 frames per second. So that's getting us pretty close to that real time playback there. Now let's go ahead and focus on the wrist area and get that to be a little bit more loose as the arm is swinging back and forth here. And the main thing that I want to focus on here is the rotate Z value, I believe. Yeah, we want this kind of back and forth rotation. So what I want to do for this is I probably just want to extend increase the amount of rotation that we're getting here as the arm actually starts to move backwards. So I'm going to grab the keyframe on four and start to bring this up just a bit to probably right around there. Again, we're just increasing the amount of rotation that we're getting. We can grab the keyframe on frame eight, continue that rotation up there. So we're just increasing the amount of sway we're kind of getting or the amount of overlap that we're kind of getting on that wrist. We can go to frame 12. I want to bring this up as well. This is the point where we'll probably have the most amount of rotation, I'm thinking, unless we might be able to get continue this rotation inward on the rotate Z past frame 12. So let me see here. Maybe at frame 16. We might adjust this value here on that contact pose. We might try just continuing the rotation, dragging behind the, the body there or the arm. So we're starting to get some really nice overlap. Then at frame 20, it's going to start to rotate back, but I'm going to bring this keyframe up to kind of ease, ease out of that transition just a bit more. I think right around there should work. Grab the keyframe on 24. I'm going to drag this down so that now the wrist is actually rotating back as the arm is moving forward. So we're getting some really nice breakup in that wrist movement and some really nice overlap on that wrist. So something like that. And then I'll probably grab the keyframe on 28 and bring this down just a bit as well to still continue the rotation backward before it starts to rate, rotate forward after that contact position. So something about like this, I think should work fine. And then we can fix this transition here on this tangent handle to create a nice smooth transition. I might bring this keyframe down just a little bit and refine, smooth out this transition as much as I can. something like that. And then we can play this. And now you can see the really nice overlap we're getting on the wrist there through this, through this movement on the steps. And I think that's working really well there. And one thing I do want to mention is that on the, the elbow, for the most part, we've really just stuck with 
the rotate Z value. You can see there's a little bit of rotation just on the change between the contact positions, but it is a pretty minimal amount of change on like the rotate Y and then the rotate X. You can see it's such, looks like a big amount in the graph editor, but if I actually bring this keyframe down to match the other contact position, you can see there's hardly any movement. And that's generally how I like to keep it just because you can't actually really rotate your elbow in isolation like this in this direction or really twist your elbow like this in isolation. If you try that just on your arm, you're going to have to have some type of movement in your upper arm. You can't really just twist just your elbow like that without getting obviously some twist in the wrist and then some a little bit of rotation on the upper arm depending on how much you're actually twisting your elbow. And then especially on a movement like the rotate Y, this type of movement here in complete isolation is not something we really can move our elbow in that direction like that. In order to actually get our elbow kind of rotated that way, we would actually need to get our upper arm kind of involved in that rotation as well. So generally, it's a good rule of thumb to kind of keep just the rotate in the elbow um, in just this back and forth rotate Z rotation, generally how our elbow can actually move on its own. Sometimes I do animate things like the rotate Y in isolation. If I'm really getting in there and doing pretty small adjustments and really doing pretty small polishy type of details. But in general, you want to reduce the amount of that kind of isolated movement you're getting on the elbow because it can really start to make your animation kind of break from reality a bit if you really start animating your elbow completely in isolation of the upper arm. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and animate the left arm in the next video. All right, so now that we've finished animating the right arm, let's go ahead and animate the left arm for our character. So if I go ahead and play this animation, we can see our generic walk cycle, and you can see the arm animation that we created for the right arm. So we have this really nice overlapping action happening on the arm. It's loosened up quite a bit. It feels a lot more natural. On the left arm, we have the, the hand basically just moving back and forth between the contact poses. So this video will actually be pretty quick because I'm going to show you a really awesome trick that we can use when we're animating cycles like this. So what I want to do is come in here and select the shoulder control, the arm control, the elbow, and the wrist control for the right arm. And I'm just going to hold down shift and do a highlight selection around all of the keyframes for this animation. And then I'm going to right click and choose copy copy all of those keyframes. And then what I wanna do is come over here to the left arm, select the shoulder, the arm, the elbow, and the wrist control. And what I can do here is actually just go ahead and double click to highlight all of those, and then right click and choose delete. So we basically just took away all of that animation on this left arm. Now what we're gonna do is just right click in the timeline and choose paste. And you can see now that it's pasted the keyframes from our right arm to our left arm. Now we're basically getting an exact copy of that animation. So if I play this, you can see we're getting the exact same type of movement on our left arm that we have on our right arm. So this is obviously not really what we want. So what we can do is go into our graph editor and I wanna make sure that I have the left arm animation, all of these cycling properly. So I wanna select all of my control curves, go up here to curves, pre-infinity cycle, curves, post-infinity cycle. And then now what I need to do is basically shift all of these keyframes down to happen at frame 16. That way we can delay this animation that's happening and we'll get the proper cycle. So we'll basically get the opposite movement of what is currently happening. And since we have these curves cycled, we should get the proper setup that we want. So what I wanna do is in the graph editor, I can just shift select to make sure I lock my movement down. And then I'm just gonna drag all the way to the right until we hit frame 16, which is the next contact, because we know on frame zero is the first contact, frame 16 is the opposite contact. So we wanna move all these keyframes to that opposite contact position. And now you can see the arm is in the proper position. So we have the arm back where it needs to be 
on this first contact position behind the character with the right arm in front of the character. And now if we play this, because we have that curve cycling, you'll see we're gonna get proper movement. So we basically just copied all of that information from the right arm to the left arm without having to do any extra animation on the left arm. We don't have to go through and animate all that movement again. We created something that we like on the right arm and just reuse that for the left arm. Now what you can do at this stage, if you don't want it to be an exact copy, an exact mirror of what is happening, you can actually go ahead and just copy all that animation and then go in here if you want to and change it up just slightly so that it's a not so that it's not an exact copy of what's happening on the right arm. So you can go in here and tweak some of the keyframes, tweak some of the, the positions of the arm through this motion to change it up a bit. That way it's not an exact copy. But for our purposes, this is gonna give us really nice results without having to do any extra work. So now that we have both of the arms moving properly, we've got our walk cycle in a really good place. So in the next video, we're just gonna go through and do some final polish on this walk, maybe fix up some of the knee pops that are currently happening, and just make sure our walk cycle is in a solid place. All right, so in this video, we're just gonna do a final pass on our generic walk cycle, clean up anything that we feel like still needs to be tweaked a little bit. Um, one thing that we could do is come in here and actually animate the fingers. Uh, for a walk cycle like this, I would probably keep the finger animation pretty simple. Uh, we have these controls here where we can tr control just the overall curling of the fingers. We also have like these cup and spread attributes. What we can also do is come in here and actually individually select these finger controls. And I would actually probably just animate these as an entire group just to do like a really quick um, kind of first first pass on these fingers. Um, maybe even grab the thumb finger controls and then you can see when I grab all of those, I can kind of move and rotate them all together. Uh, the thumb might be a little bit off that rotation so I might actually deselect that and just for now do just a pass on the right hand here to kind of show that process. But I'll actually go ahead and probably delete all the keyframes in the middle of our walk and then just go through here and go to like frame six, add like a little bit of drag to the fingers, maybe actually open them up a little bit. And you can see I'm just doing these by selecting all of those finger controls. I'm not really worrying about offsetting the fingers. I'm just doing like a pretty quick finger pass on all these. Maybe at 22, the fingers can curl in a bit and then rotate that way just a little bit. And then they'll just go back to their regular pose at 32. So you can see we're getting just some like rough finger animation, mainly just to loosen up the fingers a bit. And then of course you can take and go as much detailed as you want on this. Through here, we got the fingers actually going through the thigh. So maybe you could open up some of the fingers more in this section to try to get them from passing through the leg. Um, I'll actually undo that. I'm not sure if I like how far the fingers open up. I think something a bit more subtle works fine. I'm not too worried about them going through the leg there. But yeah, this is really the just a very quick kind of finger pass just to kind of loosen up the fingers a bit. I do feel like this point the fingers are probably actually dragged too much, so I'll reduce that. Something like that. And then maybe we could grab the thumb controls and I'm gonna delete the keyframes here and then do something similar. So here the thumb might actually open up a bit. Maybe rotate that way. Again, kind of just to loosen up the fingers here and then as the hand moves back, the thumb will kind of curl back there. Um, just something like that. And I think maybe the thumb is opening up too fast and too much at frame seven. So I'm gonna shift this over a couple frames to have something behave a bit more like that. So I'll just do that on the right hand. You can kind of see the process I would take to add a bit of finger animation to that section. Um, the next thing that we can do is go through some of the controls on this rig and mess around with adding like a little bit more sort of squash and stretch to the chest. And a lot of the times I'll do that just with some up and down on the chest. So I can kind of run through a quick sort of process of this. So as the hips drop here, I'll probably grab the 
translate Y and bring that up. Honestly, not a very far amount. We're kind of dragging and stretching the chest up as the hips drop, adding like a little bit of stretch to the chest. And I'm keeping this really subtle. We don't want to go too crazy with it and have like really big stretching on the chest. We're keeping this just kind of a generic. We're not going too cartoony with this walk, just a generic style walk. And I'll probably go to frame eight and bring this down to maybe right around here. And then you can see we're starting to squash the translation on this chest. We're actually bringing the chest down. And you see, as I actually translate this chest control, we're getting some really nice squashing on the entire torso, which is gonna give us some really nice subtle squash and stretch on the chest area. And then I'll jump forward to frame 12, and I'll probably just bring this down quite a bit. I don't want it to get to zero quite yet. So just do something like that. And I might actually bring this up on this position. So it means my contact positions, the translate Y and the contact positions might be a little bit different. I might actually extend a bit of the squash and stretch here. Let me see how this looks. Um, so here goes to the down position. So this, I want to carry that position up and I just want to have this continually moving up through the contact and then as it drops into the down position we're getting that stretch and then it'll compress again into the passing and then we can get something about like this it's going to be pretty rough but we can kind of see and you can see that what I'm doing here is I'm not necessarily keeping the squash and stretch from this step to this step exactly the same. I'm kind of just tweaking values to kind of just go with whatever I feel like will look the best and I can play it through here. Um, something that we can start doing at this point of our walk cycle, we have the really strong foundation in this walk cycle. And if we want to start getting, you know, a bit more polishy with some of our details, we don't have to have each step each side of the step on this character, the character stepping forward with their right foot and then stepping with their left foot, we don't necessarily have to keep that exactly the same mirrored version for each step. We can kind of play around with the values there. And I kind of like that extra little compression that we get with that second step here. So it kind of stretches here, goes into the passing position. It's continually squashing down moves up, we get a larger stretch and a snappier down position there. Something like this, I think will work for us. And of course you can play around with this as needed. We can extend this to see how that looks, getting more stretch and squash on these positions. And we can play around with, you know, just adding a bit more to it and actually kind of like the the feeling that increasing the squash adds to it. So I might do something like this. I might actually bring up this value here just a little bit on the contact positions. Something like this. We can test this and see how it looks. And I kind of like the um, that amount of squash and stretch on the chest area. So that's just a cool way you can add a bit more polish to this walk cycle. And then what we can do is come in here to, if you see any like knee popping on your steps, we can come in and select the foot control and tweak some of these length values on the foot here. So if you see that, feel like the knee is popping a little bit too quickly, you can adjust these length values and tweak those as needed too. So obviously if you're just kind of following along with this tutorial, your the gait of your step is probably not going to be exactly the same as mine. So in your version, you might have less knee popping, maybe more knee popping, but the length control you could, will allow you to make small adjustments to the stretching on the knee to fix some of this. So I'm going to set a keyframe here. And then here, I feel like that knee might be extending just a little bit too quickly right there. So I'll kind of ease into that straight pose a bit more. And a lot of the times this just means kind of frame by framing this length value. So what we might see here is that, yeah, we get this like 
quick stretch, the straight leg, the straight knee pose into immediately bending over like a frame. So we get this kind of snappy feeling to the knee, which we don't necessarily want. So we can kind of just, again, just very slightly tweaking the length value by again, trying to reduce some of this big popping that's gonna happen here. So moving into the straight on that contact works. Right here, this might be too much of a knee bend over one frame. So what we could do is just ease that off and reduce the stretching or the length on that pose. So we kind of just slightly ease into the leg bend pose just over a few more frames. And just to create something like that, um, to reduce a bit of that knee popping there. And then same on this foot, we can go through here and see if there's any big red flags, big issues. I think the pose from zero to one, we can add a keyframe to that and maybe reduce the bend happening here just by a little bit. And something like that, I think should work just fine for us. Awesome, so now that we've got this walk cycle, this generic walk cycle created here, you can see we've really fleshed out the entire walk cycle. We made sure that we kept it a pretty simple style of walk. We wanted to just make sure that we're able to nail those main poses of our walk cycle, the contact down passing and up position. We didn't go too exaggerated with it. We wanted to feel like a pretty natural style walk with maybe a little bit more kind of swagger for our character here. So what I wanna do now in the next video to really finish out this, this generic walk cycle is I'm gonna go over the process of how we can actually get this moving forward in 3D space. So let's go ahead and go over that in the next video. All right, so in this video, we're gonna go over how we can actually move our walk cycle that we've created forward in 3D space. So whenever we started this walk cycle, we created this treadmill type of walk cycle, which is a much easier way to create a walk cycle than actually building your walk cycle to actually move forward in 3D space. It's hard to create a nice, smooth forward motion if you start building that in to your walk cycle at the very beginning. So it is a little bit easier to animate this treadmill type of walk cycle and then actually have it translate forward in 3D space. So what we're gonna do is I'm going to select this left foot control. And this is actually a pretty simple process to do this. So I'm gonna select my left foot control. I'm gonna go to translate Z and I wanna copy the two keyframes that show or describe the translation of the foot moving backwards. So you can see we have our foot contacting. So basically it moving backwards to the next contact position at frame 16. All right, and then I'm going to copy those two keyframes. Then I'm gonna to go to this master main control here that moves our entire rig. I'm gonna to go to the translate Z value for this. I can go ahead and just delete all those other keyframes. And then I'm gonna select that first keyframe and go to edit, paste. All right, so it's pasted that exact same translation value to the main control. Now what this has done is since it's pasted that value, we have the main control moving backwards as well as the foot control. So we're getting this double translation happening. The foot's moving backwards and the main control's moving backwards at the exact same rate. So we're getting this almost like moonwalk type of feel for our characters. So the easy way to fix this is if we select both of those keyframes, go up to edit, we can go to scale, and open up the option box. We can go ahead and reset our settings to make sure we're working at the exact same settings here. And then go to value scale pivot. I'm gonna change that from one to negative one. And that will basically flip this curve around. So you can see that's completely reversed this curve. So we can do that with the scale keys. I also have this script that can be really helpful, which is just the flipped flip command you can see up here in, which is just this flip command which you can see here in my shelf, and I can select that, and it's gonna do the exact same thing there, but we can also just use this value scale just as easily. So now that has reversed that curve, basically. So now this curve is actually moving, 
or this main control is actually moving forward at the exact same rate that the foot is moving backwards. So now we actually have this character actually moving forward in 3D space. That foot is staying completely planted on the ground. Even though this foot is actually moving, we can see it here in our translate Z value in our channel box. That foot is actually translating backwards in space. But since this main control is moving forward at the exact same rate and timing, we have it completely locked and it's appearing as if it's completely locked on the ground because our main control is also moving. So now what we can do is go to our translate Z value. We can select both of those keyframes. Let's go to curves, pre-infinity linear, or excuse me, let me actually undo that. Go to pre-infinity and do cycle with offset and then go to post infinity cycle with offset. So it's basically just going to continue this curve at that exact same value for an infinite amount. So we get this perfectly straight curve flowing through here. So that means we're, our walk is going to travel nicely through 3D space here and we can play this animation and see how it's looking. So now we actually have our walk translating forward in 3D space. So this is really the approach I would take once I actually want to get my walk no longer in this kind of treadmill type of walk cycle. And a lot of the times when you do decide to do this, you can see some issues in your animation that you may need to adjust. Once you actually see your character moving in 3D space, you might notice that maybe the up and down on the hips isn't as strong as it needs to be when I actually see it moving forward or maybe the arm swings need to be larger you might spot some things like that but luckily i think the walk cycle that we've created works pretty well once we've just added on that forward movement to the main control and something else that we can do once we add this forward movement on here is that once you add it on here you can just select this main control and go to the Translate Z, right click and choose Mute Selected. So it's going to mute the animation on this curve and we get this treadmill walk back in our scene again. So you can continue animating this walk cycle like you would go back to animating it like a treadmill walk cycle to adjust any issues that you see. And then you can always unmute this curve to see the animation play again. See how the animation is looking, actually traveling in 3D space. Go back and then mute the curve again to make any adjustments as needed. And I'll go ahead and unmute selected again. All right, so we've actually gone through the entire process that I take for creating a bipedal walk cycle. So you can really see how important it is to really first establish those main key poses of your walk cycle, take advantage of Maya's tools and being able to actually mirror and flip your animation to make it a lot faster and easier to create a walk cycle like that.